This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is The Beirut Banyan. I think this is the right weather for this type of conversation. Yeah. It's intimate inside, it's raining outside. I'm not going to repeat or intentionally repeat anything that both Jed and I have discussed together. I'd like to build from what we spoke about before. But towards the end, there will be a Q&A. So if you want to order food or drinks in the break, that's fine. But the Q&A, you can ask us whatever you'd like. But this is my way of extending a hand to you, Jad, for th- really thanking you for continuously talking to me about many different, different subjects. It's my pleasure. Some of them heavy on politics, some of them not so heavy, some of them more personal. And I think in the last, in the last two years of podcasting from my side, I've said this to many people, I'll say it to you directly, your episode, the one that you recorded with me, has been by far my favorite discussion I've had in this country. Glad to have that. Why so? Well, I think there's some feedback, right? Yeah. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah. It's because there's, there's a few reasons I can think of right away. The first is going to your home. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sold now. It's I gone. Moved. Yeah. This going to Kaslik, going to your home, a home that you've lived in for most of your life, seeing that your apartment looks just like mine, we have similar books on our bookshelves, and seeing you dressed more or less the way I'm dressed, t-shirt and shorts or whatever, sandals, and very basic, but the way I like to dress. And close weight also. You lost weight? No, no, we are close. Oh, we're good. (laughs) We're both a little too heavy. And I knew that I could trust you. And I knew that not only because I've watched most of your episodes, but I knew from the way you were asking the questions and what you wanted from me, I had absolute comfort from beginning to end. And I think that's the magic we created, maybe unintentionally, because I don't think either one of us really thought that that episode would be maybe channeled later. Yeah. Maybe in ways that made me uncomfortable, actually. But that said, that to me was the beginning of a very strong and important relationship I have with someone that I can talk to openly. And I know we don't know each other that well, but I feel like I know you. Yeah, same and, feeling. And I think that's the advantage of having a podcast. You're the podcaster I watch regularly and listen to, and that's my way of saying thank you. Thank you. I'll also say, I want to say this very clearly, and I think most of the audience would have seen me right before the elections, that I made a decision when I thought our conversation was not being shared the right way. (laughs) And I saw you almost replying to the way those clips were being shared. I thought it damaged the conversation. So I stood up for you. And I think... My, my memory is a bit foggy, but I think I said something like, your work ethic is profound and you're a gentleman. And that's the kind of relationship I want. I will also say that both of us are particular people because we have a platform that is pretty much our own. Yeah. And no one can intrude on us, which is why I think both of us are sincere in what we do. And I think that's why this audience here is mixed. There are people that don't agree with each other sitting here right now. I have a few stalkers in the room as well (laughs) on social media. Maybe you do as well. But I'm always defending this. And I'll say one more thing. In the last two years, your name has been brought up 
in the most uncomfortable places for me, like Starbucks bathroom Kaslik. I'm minding my own business. I, I need to hear about this. Yeah. Somebody comes up to me, bro, shiftak majad ghusan. I'm like, ah. okay, let me finish first. In what position were you? What up? Were you not? <laughs> sitting or standing? Just to know. Standing. Yeah. Because sitting, <laughs> that would be problematic. I would not have stood up. <laughs> <laughs> I would have closed the door. This happens even in unexpected places. I'll be in Batroon swimming, minding my own business. I'll see somebody on the coast beginning to swim towards me. And then in the middle of the sea, bro, ahla hadith, anta wajad ghusan. I'm like, yeah, not here. <laughs> Look, leave me alone. <laughs> and this is true. Right before coming here, I was sitting in Jamaiza with two friends. They brought you up. So I think the last two years I've had to speak on your behalf, although it's not my right. But I'm always defending this principle, which is the podcasts you and I do are unique. We're not just talking for the sake of talking. We're part of the story. And I think that's, that's magic. So let me begin by asking you your personal situation post-elections. Yeah. I think... Watching the elections was hard enough. Running for the elections is in itself a journey. And then really, really close results. Yeah. 80 or some votes away. If you look back now, eight months later, are you relieved in any way that you're able to do this and podcast and do other things rather than being stuck in a situation maybe you wouldn't want to be in? And I'm opening the door here to see, really, if there's any comfort in not having won the elections. Yeah, first of all, thank you for the long introduction. That's because, what I do. Uh, you're more eloquent that I, than I can be. I will do my best. Uh, yes, definitely, I'm, I'm relieved to be here now. And I'm relieved to having not won the elections to be able to do what I really want to do because I believe that me running for elections is the exception it's not it's not what I imagine myself doing and if our situation in the country as a whole wasn't that dire I wouldn't have done that mm. but uh, the, the whole purpose of running uh, in the elections and choosing Matin, which is not the easiest of places, yeah. was f just like a political statement uh, that any change movement, let's call it, cannot really be instrumental in a, on a long-term basis if it's not guided by a political program, a clear political program. Uh, which tackles the details of what we should do. So it was a statement, not against, I don't like this for and against, but it's a statement between, quote-unquote, against some of the change movements that are just uh, basing their movement as a whole on a specific point that uh, those who are in government or the rulers in general in Lebanon, the, the classical rulers that we have are bad, we are good, so vote for us, and that is change. To another stance, which is, it's not uh, black or white. Yes, definitely they are bad, or else we are not living in this, the, mm. the way that we are living now. But it's, uh, it's more complicated and it, any movement, even on a personal basis, should be guided by something. And it shouldn't be uh, guided by just a negative connotation that yeah. these people are not doing their job. Okay, and what is the right job to do? Mm. That's the uh, flip of the coin. And because I, I don't want to be a real pessimist, but I was thinking at the beginning of the two, last year, 2022, that the window of opportunity that we might have to really affect public issues is narrowing down and we don't have much more time. So mm. 
whatever leverage any one of us have should be used. So when, when, when I was asked to run, even though it was a risky thing to do personally for my career and what it might engender later on on me. So I said, Khalas, given our situation, I'll, I'll be all in. Yeah. And we'll see what happens. I didn't know how it will end up as a result, small margins and how it ended up. Uh, before the last 10 days of the elections, I was just getting messages from friends I have in different political parties, in Matin specifically, mm. that uh, from what we know from the campaigns that we work with, you are doing good, you're going to lose, but you're going to lose about by about the difference of 1,000 votes which was considered a huge uh, number mm -hmm. from their standpoint. It ended up being closer than that. But uh, that's the first part of your question in my long answer. But uh, to finish... Long intro, long answer. Yes, we, we talk do. a lot and that's good for podcasts. But I, exactly. have, I hope it's not boring. I don't know if anyone's asleep yet. I don't think so. so we're fine. So uh, now looking back at it, I believe that I'm relieved... For another, uh, because of another thing, which is I'm really disappointed, not with the change MPs, but with the whole uh, parliamentary outlook as a whole. Mm. Uh, before the elections, I used to say that uh, I'm running to the election not to uh, engender any uh, false hopes that through parliament change can be brought about in Lebanon. Real power doesn't lie in the parliament or within the institutions of the state. But it's good as a platform to use it in an effort to try to bring together uh, the good intentioned political players around a specific political program that we can negotiate on. And it's a good platform to talk with, uh, with people. Mm -hmm. Because once you have this MP before your name, then uh, more lights are brought to you and more cameras so you can talk with people more. Other than that, it cannot serve the cause thinking that through parliament one can do anything. I'm disappointed that any MP in the parliament didn't use his uh, seat in order to try to create a certain dynamic towards uh, having a different kind of balance of power. I believe that most of the change MPs, not all of them, are too much worried with their own image and how they can sustain it mm. while at the same time knowing that they are perceived by the population and by those who voted for them as incapable of doing anything. It's not their fault that they are incapable. They have a fault that they didn't it's, 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 we have passed a year since the elections and they, till now, they don't have any, not a big political program, but some sort of political paper that they agree on and they can have a discussion with their constituents through. Anyways, that's it. You know, I, I'll extend this question to an episode I recorded here two weeks ago with this gentleman in the corner, Ziad Abishakir. Who's, who ran for elections and put up a great fight. Maybe I'm being selfish saying this, but I think these types of minds are better at pressuring politics from outside. And you know another thing that uh, will come to mind if you run to an election? Hmm. When someone asks you, what if you win? So you start answering by a political question, what can we do and uh, how can you use this platform? But then when you go home, you have this personal question. What do I do personally if I'm an MP? Because now the salary of an MP is around $100 mm. per month. So how can I live with that income? I cannot have the same impact at work you doing the podcast as yeah. i would hope then i started asking myself how does the 128 mps that we have live 
So you're either a millionaire and you can be an MP and have a simple life or you cannot be an MP or if you are not a millionaire and you are an MP, you have to find solutions to how you're being funded. Mm. And this is a big question mark. This word, and I'm going to bring it up later in the episode, I think is also what made me comfortable talking to you about many things is that I know you're a one-man show. Yeah. And I know that because we talk about YouTube ad revenue. Yeah. <laughs> we talk about PayPal or Patreon. We talk about camera prices, audio equipment. And I know that that kind of person who's trying to do the right thing and this type of paralyzed parliament, I think would be stuck with things that are useless. Yeah. And I uh, think you're... I totally agree. Your talent, and I'm again, this is subjective. I'm being selfish here. I think your talent is in persuasion. And I think politics, maybe doesn't have to be politics as in elections. Politics can literally be a journalist who starts a platform, expresses their views, challenges people, and takes many in Lebanon into a direction that's new, which is independent. No funding, independent. I want to explore this word with you. But you know, I, I have yeah. just one comment because it's a big dilemma that I have mm. because I, I, I studied political science and I was intrigued by politics at, at the beginning because of my father and because he used to talk about politics all the time. So I wanted to be an adult by doing politics. But then through my major, my interest in politics was always an intellectual interest. Mm -hmm. I, I, I used to be in the FPM, so I, I had a partisan experience. But it was in, in university, it's, it's a very safe place. My main interest was intellectual with politics. The problem is that now I'm 36, so it's, it's been at least 15 years since I've I consider myself accumulating some experience with politics in Lebanon, personal experience. The problem is that having an impact intellectually in politics is very interesting, hmm. but it's very limited in efficiency because politics is a very uh, real politics in real life. is a very bad place to be because uh, nothing really cares, uh, nothing really matters if you don't have hard power in hand. You know, I think you do. Uh, I think you sure. do. I, well, maybe we share the same trait, and that's why I like talking to you. It's that sometimes this level of modesty can be self-inflicted too. I think you've shaped a discourse that's new. And I don't think this would have been possible in Parliament. Let me offer a simple analogy. And I don't want to be hard on anyone that's in Parliament right now. The episodes you do, I think, drive the conversation further than anything that's happened in Parliament in the last eight months. Yeah. And I know that you said this several ways. You wouldn't have stopped your podcast had you been in Parliament. Yeah. Which, but that's an interesting journey in itself. You'd be preoccupied with many things and still doing a podcast. I think the fact that you're able to hone in exclusively, or for the most part, on what you're gifted at, I think uh, is an asset. And it allows someone like me to rethink my own assumptions. But you know, th that's, that's a cultural impact mm. with long-term results, mm. because it's in incremental. While politics, uh, real politics, works in another, uh, on another time, pl time uh, clock. Real politics meaning... Enough. Meaning on and the ground. Meaning mm. that if, if you have, in a country such as ours at least, because mm. we have a, a, an unstable political system, which is really run as we used to study international relations, where you don't have a constitution and institutions. You have purely balance of power. So the country is run purely by the balance of power. So uh, t t being a little bit extreme, just to make an example... So if, if you have a, a thousand of academic hours or a thousand hours of interesting podcast and you have an, an incremental uh, influence through your podcast or shaping a discourse, 
takes someone with a Kalashnikov here to just uh, change the narrative to something else. Yeah. Because soft, the limits of soft power is hard power. So soft power has an influence until hard power comes to place. Mm -hmm. And in Lebanon, uh, th this whole confessional rhetoric uh, insinuating always that I used to think that anytime I see two leaders, Zaim, having some sort of uh, dialogue, it implies in itself a threat. If this fails, things can go mm. back to war. So this is hegemony. I completely agree with the use of violence can end both of our discussions, both of our lives. That's absolutely true. But when comparing to the soft power that you wield, and I'm trying to imagine your dilemma had you been forced to make a decision whether or not to sleep in parliament. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to sleep in parliament. Okay. So you've answered that already. Yeah. But how you would be able to approach that subject being stuck in a situation like Ba'abda that's clearly not being decided here. Mm, I can imagine that would take away from the soft power you wield and maybe it would curtail it to a point. But maybe I'm wrong. Perhaps I'm wrong. Maybe you can do both. But I find independence, and that's why I wanted to go back to this word. I think independence is built by being literally a one-man show. And that's a, it's a compromise, I think. It's a compromise, definitely. And uh, it limits you yeah. in ways, and it opens up the world for you in other ways. Exactly. And but, I want to I ask you here, yeah. and I don't, this is not meant to be a psychological question, but do you feel alone in what you do? Yes, and I, I, somehow I'm built that way. So somehow, uh, uh, even when I used to work at uh, Al Jadid, uh, I'm not the best person when it is my end product to be broadcasted uh, for uh, a group work. Hmm. I'm always fearful that some somebody will do something wrong. So the problem with that is that uh, your productivity is so low. That's what I'm trying to change now. But I don't, I don't know what is the right timetable mm. for me to say that I will be able to make this transition in order to have a group of people that we don't have to think alike but we have to share the same values yeah. uh, in order to be able to work together. The problem with that is, personally, I have to be accustomed to it through and through. But secondly, you have to have the financial means to do it. Yeah, It's not that simple. Uh, and the other problem that I have is that I, I value so much the independence that I have. But at the same time, I know that Sometime down the road, you will have to do compromises and to work in institutions. And I have a long experience, long relatively, um, 10 years of experience working in uh, uh, media institutions where you are in an ongoing negotiation. It's not spoken, it's not, uh, it's not like a real on-table negotiation, but you are trying to widen your margin and do what you think you should do. And you can't do that unless in terms of balance of power inside the institutions, you acquire some leverage. And this leverage will be used to... And I have to do both, and I'm not sure uh, when and how I will be able to have the right balance. Working in a group on my own independent project and being able being able to work in an institution if my personal life requires that in terms of revenue and how you should live. The revenue factor, and especially if you're trying to make a living by doing what you love doing without getting a paycheck, yeah. or at least a traditional one. YouTube is not someone we go to their office and we meet them and we, yeah. we don't have YouTube on WhatsApp. We get a monthly fee. I find that to be a blessing. Because it, it frees up a lot of space to really do exactly what I want to do. 
And then there's no one saying you can't speak to this person or you should ask the questions differently to that guest. I love that absolute freedom, yeah. but it's very hard. It's very hard and I, I, I'm going to ask you now a question. Sure. Don't, don't you have this at the back of your head, a certain mild anxiety. It's not like an anxiety that you cannot uh, go with your day. When will this stop? <laughs> When will this interest go? When will YouTube change? So we are we are we are entangled with too many variables that we are we can't control. I've noticed. I don't. Maybe it's different between us because we have, I think, a different audience that sometimes meets for yeah. certain subjects. I found, and I think we can go into this right now. I find that social media is destroying the whole story, not YouTube but social media in other ways, meaning the clips that are shared on Instagram that can literally take a two-hour conversation and turn it into a circus. Yeah. And suddenly, we're, the whole purpose is eroded. And sound bites on social media and swipes and clicks and basically doing an episode only because you're going to get traction, I think that destroys it. I, I'll give you an example. And not to make it about him, but I would never want to talk to Carlos Ghassan. I don't really care. He's a fugitive. I don't really care what he says about himself. But I know that if I posted an episode with him, that would be maybe the biggest episode I've done. Right. Second to Sharb al Nahas, <laughs> maybe. Or at least the first, one of the top two. I don't care about that. But I don't want... Oh, oh... Oh, now you feel at home. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Or that's Carlos Ghassan. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the good news is the video is still filming, but we have to wait. Uh, the it's still recording, too. Uh, the audio is still don't, recording? Don't mess with the Ghassan family. Don't say <laughs> Carlos Ghassan. <laughs> Or maybe it was Sharban Nafas. <laughs> Or maybe they say two and it goes out. But uh, is it? What? It's it's still. Uh huh. Oh, there we go. Carlos Ghassan. <laughs> I I guess what I was trying to get at is numbers don't matter to me, and you know what I get? It's a disadvantage that I have, in that I speak English for the most part on the podcast, guests can speak Arabic, which is fine. I was mentioning before we started, William Noon, I went to Jbeil between interrogation and his journey home. I met him, Jbeil. We spoke for roughly an hour. He spoke in Arabic, I spoke in English. I know that if that conversation was done in Arabic, it would get more traction. But I don't care. I really yeah. don't care. I'm doing what I'm comfortable doing, and I... I'm okay with that. And that, I think, is being taken away slowly by stupidity. <laughs> Social media, and we're the same, roughly the same generation. We know AUB. Yeah. We've had the same professors. We're, we're of the same cloth. We're the post-war kids that know a time where you had to read Fawaz Trabulsi. Yeah. He's not an influencer. He's an astute observer, and you need to understand him. Sometimes you have to read him more than once to properly get him. And if you're lucky like us, you meet him. And if you're really lucky like you, you get to host him on the podcast. Imagine that on Instagram. And I, I, I don't want to beat up Instagram. It's not Instagram. It's social media has made attention spans silly. Yeah. And the YouTube shorts, I avoid them altogether. How can you turn a podcast into a one-minute snippet? Yeah, and I believe it's also detrimental to the to the whole branding of a podcast. Yeah, because uh, a couple of days ago, I, I I had an interview with uh, some guy who is uh, a researcher, and he collects uh, photographs from the 19th century about this region. He mm. is uh, from the SSNP, Hazb al-Sur al-Qawm al 
So, uh, and he has a radical viewpoint on issues. And I thought that this interview can be interesting because I had an interview with uh, Nouran Asif, yes, the uh, journalist and the writer who had several books, and one of them is on Fouad Shaib. Yeah, this was your last episode. This uh, is my last episode. Yeah. Yes. So I said that maybe some people don't know, but uh, the SSNP has a different outlook on the whole Fouad Shaib uh, era. Mm. So let's discuss it. Uh, and during this these two hours of conversation, I believe there are, let's put it this way, uh, many controversial moments. So one of the guys that were with me during the interview uh, told me, you can have some big promos. And many interviews I had, one can have sometimes some uh, those controversial moments. Mm. But uh, I'm against that, and I don't want to do that. Even uh, those who follow the podcast can see that the titles of the videos are a little bit boring, and that's intentional, because I believe that anything uh, that can just minimize a whole interview to a specific moment or a specific slogan will give away the whole purpose that... I'm trying to reach that it's trying to have a conversation. Yeah. Conversations have to last a little bit more than 20 seconds. Yeah. And uh, take a look at our interview. Once it has been used in those snippets for political purposes, it can have that effect. Mm -hmm. It can, everything can be used yeah. for a specific agenda. Yeah. And the agenda can be just attracting attention mm -hmm. to have more people watching this and to yeah. make more money out of it. I can do more money if I uh, host those controversial figures. Sometimes I have done, but not for the, you know, when, when I host Jamil Said, I know that he is a controversial figure. Yeah. But the purpose of hosting Jamil Said wasn't to get into this uh, a rhetoric between the 14th and 8th of March if mm. we use the old terms to simplify issues. It was just to have the conversation about how can someone that claims that have many points of differences with Hezbollah on internal political issues, be it big issues, and still say that I'm in this alliance. So that was the point, and we went into some, something that I wasn't prepared for to get into his uh, old experiences for about mm. an hour and a half. But I could have used that interview for sensational uh, right. ends. And that, let me let me I'll, I'll add to what you're saying. I know that that's your method because you do not take snippets. You simply don't. You let the YouTube episode or the audio episode stand on its own. Mm -hmm. And I I got the feeling you were uncomfortable in that episode. And I think it, it showed that maybe that's not exactly how you would have wanted the discussion to evolve, that it took a turn that was more on his terms than yours. Yes, what, what happened is that, I, I in my mind, I wanted to have a background. I wanted him to give his own background. Mm. Uh, just for it to be fair. Mm -hmm. And uh, giving his background, he went into interesting uh, issues like uh, his assassination attempts. Uh, assassination Even his attempts driving his car him. from Zahdi yeah, to... Yeah, when, when he was uh, in the 80s. In the 80s, yeah. yeah uh, and those were interesting. But they took away a large chunk of the episode. Mm. So, I have to keep in mind that this cannot go on forever. Yeah. So, I was left with around 50 minutes to discuss the, all of the other issues. So, I was picking and choosing where to have an interference. Mm. Because if I do it on each and every single point, it will go forever. I had the same issue with Suleiman uh, Tony, Tony. Frangie. 
You know, let, let me offer comparisons and see how you, how you see this. Do you think of yourself as part of this part of the discussion where you're able to challenge the guest are you do you have the position of if i hear something that's wrong i'm going to say it and i i want to be part of that discussion or do you rather let the guest speak for themselves and maybe it's almost like a guest driven approach no I, I, when i began with the interviews the whole issue was not to have an interview but to have a discussion I feel the same way. Yeah. The yeah. problem is that once you host people that they are, that are really interesting figures, mm. uh, and most of them are above 70 years old. I have this issue with my podcast. So they are not accustomed and they don't have this palette of yeah. watching podcasts and it's a discussion. So ha they have the idea that I should be asked questions mm. and I should be able to give my answers. Sometimes th things work as I intended for them to work. Sometimes they, sometimes they don't. Not to make it about him, but do you think that Shamila Sayed took that away from you in that episode? That you were put in a position where you weren't able to... Not It's not about cornering the guest. It's more that he needs to be challenged maybe more only because he's not on the issues that were brought up mm. but on the issues that weren't because right. yeah. uh, the, there were several issues that n needed a, a certain discussion let's say or a confrontation a civil one yeah uh, giving the period where he was in power really no mm. one can say that now he is in power but since i don't believe that parliament is power he is not during the 90s he he was yeah until 2005 so this period should have been discussed much more if ever it was discussed in the episode i believe there were snippets about 2001 and stuff like that but it was just it was uh, quickly it was sort of quickly. yeah and if one wanted to discuss jamil sayed's uh, historiography let's say yeah this era is more interesting even mm. though the stories that he told were interesting but it it is more uh, not just interesting it means something politically more to the public mm. than his own personal experiences in the 80s so that was my problem with the interview yeah it's not that i uh, when i when we discussed current issues about Hasb Allah, about his relationship with them in, in the parliament, given that giving that he opposes them on the financial issue, on the issue of how to deal with Riyadh Salemi, on the issue of the Beirut port explosion and the uh, judiciary process after it. Uh, if he opposes uh, Najib Mi'ati, who Hasb Allah named to be prime minister, if mm. he doesn't give the vote of confidence for the government, where do you align? Okay, well, security only yeah but so, that's that that was the part i thought was missing from the episode that i was trying to read your mind at, yeah. at those moments that that is where i think the insert could have happened it's like you're saying something but you're implying something too that's not being said not not you i mean uh, no, mean to say no, he answered well, his answer uh, um, maybe because our understanding of his answer is different mm. What I believe the answer he answered was something to the meaning that no, I'm aligned with Hezbollah on the strategic issues. Yeah, meaning right. Syria, Iran, and the whole yes. regional issues. But we, the difference is on the internal issue, not on the end result. I mm. believe that Hezbollah shares the end result that I want for the country. Mm -hmm but on how to deal with issues. And yeah. then he said some th two, two things that I believe in my own personal understanding will come back to give one answer, which is, he said that when Michel Aoun was elected as president, I went there and I told him that in a country such as Lebanon, you need to have control of two things, the judiciary and the security mm. forces. Mm. Not for you to control, but f your whole work should be to forbid all political players to intervene there. Yeah. 
That's one. Yeah. And two, this country needs what he called Sigit Hukum, like a formula. Okay, what do you mean by a formula? He said something that relates to it needs that the government and the president of the republic should be aligned mm. and should be backed by a certain, I will call him, conciliary. And I believe that this is the job that he's aspiring to have. That's well said. You know, that you can add that post-podcast also is part of the story. That what you're saying, I think, is you're leaving documentation for us to access and you're leaving a narrative as well for us to either agree with or disagree with. But I like reflecting on these episodes. Yeah, I love to. Yeah, and I could do that all the time. You know, I leaned on you heavily to do my episode with Shab al Nahas. And I don't know if people are bored with four hours of Shab al Nahas. Yeah, it, it was too long. I, you had it, two it parts. One of the episodes that I had to just make part one and part two because yeah. it was too long. But it was everything I needed to know about him to have an episode with him. Had you not done that, I would have been at a disadvantage. I would have only read his book and his World Bank, his earlier World Bank reports, but I think you provided that for me. Yeah, and the book is a hard read. That's uh, being very diplomatic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, it has too many technical terms. Yeah. And I told him because uh, he sent me his book and he asked me for my comments. So I told him that the problem with what you are doing either in the media or in the written form, is that I don't know if it's conscious or unconscious, but you have selected your audience and mm. your audience isn't the public. Mm. Your audience is a small group of experts or politicians that really understand such stuff. Because if, if you take a read in his book, it's, very, it's a very interesting book written in in a very hard way. It's not, it's not an easy read. And I believe that it takes a lot away of the book because I believe anything political, anything economic should be discussed. His policy papers that are attached to the book, there's one maybe 2016 and one in 2018 or something like that. They're pre, one is pre-October 17 and one lines up almost at October 17. Those were easier to read and I actually found them useful. Yeah, because he told me that when I wrote the book, I knew that no one will read it, hmm. except from specific people who are interested in these matters. Yeah. So those are the people targeted by the book. Okay, but my, 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 my example is always uh, Yanis Varoufakis, who has a different approach. The former he, Greek finance, the, uh, finance minister. Yeah. He, he had. Uh, he was attacked two days ago. He was in a restaurant and he was attacked in Greece. Uh, his his perspective on economics, generally, is that we should democratize the economy, for it to be spoken simply for all people to understand and engage in this discussion because it's where their interest is being affected more, not of all political issues, but of most political rhetoric who just is empty from the inside. Hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's a stark contrast on how to communicate issues. I didn't think it would be appropriate to ask too much about Shab al-Nahas without it sounding like I'm trying to get something out of you. I'll, I'll ask it in a way no, no, that... No, no, no. I don't want it to be ask a... Ask whatever you want. <laughs> you shouldn't say that. <laughs> Please do. Please do. <laughs> Before the elections, maybe late 2021, it was sort of being whispered that you would be running. Whispered. I don't think anyone actually knew other than yourself. But that there was a moment he was considering boycotting the elections, and your name became sort of more visible. This is maybe early 2022. 20, so it's the months leading up to yeah, the elections. at the beginning of the year. Beginning of the year. 
this is again my side. I didn't want you to be in that camp, not because I think of them in a particular way. I like you for who you are. And maybe the list in Metin was more accessible to more people. Not, I think only one or maybe two were Muatinun members. Maybe one. One Shadan. Shadan. But everyone else came from different backgrounds. But I think part of my appreciation for you was that, and I, with all due respect to Shabin Nahas, I think you're better. I don't not, know. Not, not in the research, yeah. not in the history, not in his knowledge, not that, in politics. I think you're more accessible. Uh, I don't engage usually with political issues on, on this level uh, of being better or less. I believe there is a certain synergy that one should attempt to have. Mm. I know my limitations. And because I know him well, I know that he knows his limitations, specifically regarding communication skills and what's now being called uh, emotional intelligence. I know where I'm better, but specifically in terms of political engagement, for what we need now in Lebanon, I don't believe I'm better. I was asked after the elections that, uh, in my first interview, it was at Al Jadid, Josephine Deeb was the anchor, uh, that you had lots of more votes than Sherbil Nahas. And uh, many of the candidates of Muatinun lost uh, with small numbers. Yeah. So it was implied, and later on uh, during the interview, I was told frankly that uh, something to the tone of that you are better, or maybe you 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 could have been better to run without being associated to Muatinun. I think that that's a better way of saying what I meant to say. Yeah. No, it's not disrespecting. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, my answer, and I'm, I truly believe, or else I, did, I wouldn't have run into this election, specifically with Muatinun, is that what we need specifically is not for good intention people to run for office. What we need is a clear political program where our assembly is to put it in the forefront. And I know you cannot totally depersonify politics. That, that's not possible. But one should do the effort. Mm. Because if our effort is leading somewhere, I believe, it should lead for more legitimacy to some ideas, not to some people. Some ideas should have more legitimacy. So if one takes a look at the 70s of October, 20 years later, can one take a look at these demonstrations and give them specific values, not specific people leading them, but what are you trying to achieve? So that's why I believe that what Sherb al Nahas, what Muatinun did is an invaluable effort to put together a political program because it's not something easy to do. And putting a political program at hand will bring to you more enemies than friends mm. in the electorates and in the political powers because now you are trying to give your own opinion about specifics. We will not give out money to all depositors, we just can't. What we will do is this and this and this. So these people might get more chunks of their money. The relations with Saudi Arabia, the relations with Syria, the relations with Iran, how can we formulate a national agenda? So yes, some people, when they read something, can formulate opinions about it. Hmm. But if you run uh, to the parliament without any political program, no one can read anything but the values that the, you represent. So electorally speaking, it's yeah. better. Because you're not being held accountable. Yeah. So, so for, for me, I don't think I'm better because I wouldn't have had the tools that running for the election is just the means to an end. The end is the political program that I did not write. They didn't. Maybe I may have misspoken and um, I'll try to say it in a better way. 
This is a way that makes more sense. I think his pursuit depended more on you than you on him. And I think you are, if you want to be one day, you're a politician. And I think you have, you're accessible in ways that maybe a rigidity that comes from not, it's not about him, but maybe the, you said it, the book is so hard to understand. You're easy to understand. Yes. Uh, and I uh, believe that in terms of communication with the, uh, which the elections requires. Yeah. I believe I can do a better job than him. Yeah. And I maybe so again, all about selfish. I'm being selfish from beginning to end. I wanted you to run as an independent candidate. But without a political program, what does it mean? I don't know what it means for them now, since that this political program lost a lot of its internal support as well. It's another issue that can be discussed, but the problem is that a lot of people during the elections told me that why do you run? Why don't you run alone? Okay, so to do what? I think I was one of those people. <laughs> uh, uh, for me, I, I, I because. There is this feeling in Lebanon that I don't agree with, that if, and I can't be a partisan given my job because sometimes I have to give my opinion about Sherbin Nahas, about the, some decisions that they do that, that I, I know don't you approve don't, of. Exact, this is exactly so my point. Yeah. I, I need to have a margin to be a journalist. Mm. I can't be a partisan and be a journalist. Right. But if I wasn't a journalist, I wouldn't hesitate for a second to be part of Muwatinun mm. because I believe in their program or any other political party if I believe in their program. I don't believe there is sense to politi political activity outside either syndicates, parties, NGOs to a certain extent. I'm not very fond of NGOs and we can talk about it. It's a different issue. Because what I'm being told always that if you associate yourself to a political party and then we see you know, people they don't oh, I don't mm, know how to mm. translate it you know, because they, they're, they're, yeah. I believe that making a political decision isn't about your identity it isn't who you are mm. it's what you think it's what you do but we conflate politics with who you are. And I believe it's, it, it's a toxic way to view politics because if I see someone uh, uh, that is in the Lebanese forces and I believe this is who he is, that can lead in extreme ways to extreme people to uh, have some legitimacy to even reach a point to kill him. Because your politics is who you are. Mm. I don't believe that. Maybe I'm applying things that are not accurate, perhaps. But the fact that you're able to navigate terrain like Hisham Bu Nasif on a political project that's not there. It's an idea. Mm. And it's rather academic. Less, It's actually less emotional, I think, than it is more just a different form of governance that could have prejudice built into it. It could have. But I think you handled that effectively. And I, was, I love discussing political ideas, yeah. specifically if it is contradictory to what I believe in. Because yeah. then, but a real discussion. That's why I enjoyed doing with you. Right. Because my problem with the podcast that I have is finding guests to speak specifically. Uh, to have a discussion with the existing political pa parties in Lebanon. Mm. I tried to have the interview with Tony Frangi because my, my, my intention was if I want to have a discussion with some partisans from the existing political parties, I need to find what is called in the West the pu public intellectual. Each political party yeah. should have the historian yeah. that knows the history of this political party, how it was brought to life, what were the challenges, and then to talk intellectually, what are you trying to achieve as a political party, regardless of the day-to-day -day politics. I'm not going to talk about the next president or the next government. Yeah. Why are you doing politics? So the problem is that I reached a point that most of the, our political parties don't have these figures anymore. Mm. So, okay, maybe the alternative can be those who are closer to the uh, decision-making mm. circle. Mm. So, Tony Frangi is the son of Slema Frangi. That's the circle. Right, yeah. But then 
I believe that uh, uh, it wasn't the interview that I wanted to have because it's not a problem in Tony Frangi, it's in all of these politicians that are political party leaders. Mm. You cannot speak to a politician. He has too much at stake. Yeah. The whole interview or any interview will be an exercise of how to defend an image, a persona that I have, and not really talk to the person. I'm talking to the persona of Tony Frangi, I'm talking about the brand of Frangi right. towards his constituents, I can never talk to him because you can't do that. He has a lot of at stake. It's out of care and caution from my side that I don't know independent journalists in this country other than yourself and a handful of people. And that's why maybe my expectations are always that I treasure that. And the moment a group becomes part of the story, and I'm again, it's how I see it, uh, I think independence becomes... Slightly, slightly compromised, but that could be an advantage for elections. I mean, clearly, it's what you chose to that, do, and that, it made that, sense. That's a contradiction between being a journalist and uh, doing yeah, politics. Exactly. But I wanted to add also: you can you can talk to a federalist, you can talk to an idiot like me, you can talk to uh, a Twitter troll like Assad Abu Khalil, and I know that because he trolls me all the time. He's called me so many names, and some of them are funny, actually. Nice. And his humor used to be funnier when he was not on Twitter, when he had the angry uh, Arab blog. He's become a bit too much. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But you're able to engage him. You engage his ideas in classical Arabic because he's more comfortable. Yeah. That You can talk to me in English because that's what I'm more comfortable. You can talk to Jamil Sayyid. Maybe it doesn't go exactly the way you wanted, but you can do that. You can talk to Ferris Sayyid. Yeah, I love the interview first. And yeah. I also love the interview with Jamil Sayyid for the stories that he told and for the demeanor that he usually doesn't show. So it's the first time I see right. him laughing. That but that's, that's thing. the flexibility an independent person has. Because I know. Be because I, I, I don't have any hidden agenda. I don't, sorry for the words, I don't give a shit if uh, uh, some political uh, guest. Um, is trying to uh, claim some points yeah. towards his constituents. Okay, do that, do that. Let's talk about... I, I, I really love discussing things for the, for the thing of it. Maybe, maybe I think of you that way. And then when I... Again, it's not about them, but maybe Mawati Noon is more rigid than that. And any, that's where any political party has to be more rigid than that. They, they have a problem if, if they are so flexible with their thoughts. Yeah. The, yeah. But uh, yeah, may, maybe. I'm not the finding the right way of pointing yeah. the finger at it. It's like, I like you for what you do. When I see you being compromised in a way that maybe you don't, maybe you believe it, I feel like I'm losing an ally. And the ally may not even agree with me. I mean, our episode, Jed, But that was goes back to the, the, the issue that I, I told you about at the beginning of this discussion, that this is the contradiction of doing what we do. Yeah. It's really beneficial. I believe that it's beneficial because that's what I do in my, uh, in not my spare time, even in my work uh, hours. Yeah. yeah. I love to listen to interesting discussions, uh, different perspectives, just to try to understand stuff. Yeah. So that's valuable. But if you want to affect your conditions right now in this country, this is not enough. Mm. So if you go to do politics, because that is more closer to the frontiers of the battleground, let's say. Yes, it's a different battleground. It's, it's, a, it's a different place. Yeah. And uh, I saw it because I just ran to the elections. I just did that. Mm -hmm. And I was suddenly uh, a communist, fine. I was uh, a Hezbollah, uh, how to call it? Uh, agent or whatever. Yeah, yeah agent uh, or something yeah. like that. Trying to infiltrate to uh, run against the real change forces, which is Kateb or whatever. Uh, I was... You were Trojan, that's what they were saying. Yeah, yeah, Trojan, Trojan horse. Trojan horse, yeah. Uh, and I, so, so, so a person told, said, uh, and they wrote it even uh, on a certain website, that I'm running uh, uh, to confiscate the lands of the church because I'm against Christians. That's the only one that was true. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, yeah. So, so within two months, I was. Uh, you know, it just needed one more month, and I would have been a pedophile or something like that. So, okay, th these are futile issues because during the elections, you just have to smear everybody, and you just ha have to elevate the emotions to a certain standpoint. Yes, it's not the place for me to be. Yeah, but I believed back then that if if that uh, uh, has any value, so let's do it. Okay. So the bad things will go on me. Right. There is no harm on others you know, by me doing this. Uh, was that part of the decision that you knew that this is all, this in the end is completely your decision, yeah. that you're, you're taking responsibility for it? I, I, I believe that lots of people have the same case that I do. But in that specific case, I had so little to win out of this. Yeah, and so, so so much to lose, because yes, you can be smeared, you can be put in this partisan uh, place, and if you take a look of, of my political output on where is the center of power in Lebanon, it's not the parliament. So I'm not running in order to have a big block in the parliament where decisions will be taken. Yeah. So my hopes were not high. Uh, uh, my income would have uh, not got higher. So I, I had nothing to win personally. Mm -hmm. But uh, my own sense of purpose of why am I doing this? Why am I uh, following politics before uh, being uh, a journalist? I follow politics, then I should try to understand it, convey a message, uh, have discussions. So if this doesn't have any concrete result at the end, and the concrete result isn't through the elections to get to power overnight, but to just push forward in the uh, in having in the balance of power a real political force with some uh, following, having a clear political program, nothing makes sense. With it your makes sense intellectually, but not on the ground. With your permission, with the audience's permission, I'd like to extend the episode a bit. Okay. Can everyone stick around for 20 minutes extra? Yeah? Would you be able to, Jad? Yeah, I, I should leave by 9.30. 9.30. We'll end it at 9.30. Uh, I, I like talking to you. So that's my way of trying well, I have to... have long answers you have to deal with. No, they're not long at all. They're actually just the right length. But I'll give time to the Q&A as well. You mentioned something I hadn't heard you mentioned earlier. You heard your father talking politics when you were younger, and that opened the door to your curiosity in politics. Maybe you've said this in other places. I've never heard you say it. Can you open the door a bit further? What exactly was that conversation like with him? No, it's, uh, it wasn't a conversation with him. It, be it became a conversation with him. Uh, each Sunday we'd have a barbecue, the typical Lebanese Sunday lunch, and sometimes some friends of my father would come to our home. And usually each and every kind of reuni reunion, such as those, it will end up by long dis political discussions about the country and things are unbearable and we're going downwards. And I was a little kid. So I thought back then that uh, this should be something very important so each and every Sunday we have to talk about these issues and things are running really badly because the tone that everybody was speaking with is uh, is uh, deflating let's say would this have been the early 90s around then mid 90s mid 90s mid 90s I believe or at the back end of the 90s what was the conversation largely about Syria back then, as much as you can remember. Yes and no, Syria was always existing because uh, I lived in Juni and uh, whether you were Aouni or Uwait or Kata'ib or whatever you were, you were against, against the Syrian mm. occupation back then. Uh, but usually what uh, eats out of these big issues is the daily life politics. Mm. What's going on with our uh, 
incomes and what's going on in the country as a whole will it go back to civil war because it was mm, yeah, we just five after, years yeah. out of the civil war yeah so the, the daily lives so it was a plethora of political issues and uh, when i heard recurrently these political issues being spoken on our table usually not to me directly because i was a kid my father wouldn't have a discussion with me at that time uh, I had this, uh, I, I remember, I, I, that was really in my early teenage years, let's say. Okay, uh, then I should really understand these issues and we should yeah. fix them. <laughs> Very simply, if, if we had something going wrong, wrong in the country and everyone is uh, having a bad time talking about it, especially people that I trust and I love, such as my parents, then okay, I should be involved in these issues and I should, when I get bigger, be involved there. Because some, something, we should, I should do something. But this is, if, if you could find a moment that you can sort of trace back and say this is where this story starts. Is it in those Sunday discussions? Yeah, that uh, that's the image that I remember. At yeah. least I, I don't have a vivid memory about my childhood, which is, it's, it needs uh, a shrink to talk mm. to. Uh, but well, here you are. <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> but uh, I believe that these issues YouTube will pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> these issues are crucial. Uh, the people that I trust uh, are having a bad time with the current state of affairs in Lebanon, and I should do something about it. And back then, I didn't understand the connotations, the real connotations of having the Christian background. Mm. So back then, you can feel Ahbat al-Maruni. Yes, yeah. So, na was maybe part of it because mm. they weren't feeling part of the political system. Mm. Uh, and that was the spark of, okay, let's do something about it. But later on, you understand that uh, sometimes, I don't, I'm not, <laughs> these are my parents that I love and I trust, so, but yes, sometimes in Lebanon, we mistake engaging in politics with na. Yeah. So uh, I don't believe that's saying anything in politics. If we just say it's unbearable, the country is going to the sewage or whatever. These are modes sometimes to relieve ourselves of any responsibility of why things are the way they are. So we don't do anything politically, but we disassociate ourselves from what's going on. Yeah, and we consider this disassociation is a political stance. It is a, a, an apolitical outlook on what's going on. Yeah, I'll open the door on my side, and I'd like you, if you at any point you want to ask me stuff, interject because you're the podcaster too. Uh, I, it's not the same routine, but it's the same memory but it's a different time and it's a it's almost like an alien country it is talking about the 1990s and maybe my conversation start a few years earlier maybe around 91 92 it's syria is there in the background but there's a lot of hesitation there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of questioning whether or not this is a country you can raise a family so that's really early 1990s. And there's a discussion of inflation. The lira went from something like 1,750 to 3,000. Yeah, I, I wasn't during that day. Uh, I was just maybe six years old. Or five years. But that was, you know, we were looking at the new notes being printed all the time and comparing it al mitenu khamsin. I'm talking really innocent stuff, but it's not an innocent time. It's devalued lira. And always Hafiz al-Assad in the background, but not talking about him, meaning alluding to him, but not saying his name. But I want to add something. I've never really said this on the podcast. Admiration for Hezbollah. Back then? Yeah. Uh, we didn't share the same background. That's a problem with Lebanon, in fact, because if you live in different regions, you have a different uh, hist uh, narrative about the country as a whole. Mm. It was easier to speak loudly against Hafiz al-Assad. In 
in Junior yeah, yeah, versus and, and Christian circles. Yeah. I believe what was really crucial back then not to say it on TV, which mm. was our case. But everywhere you go, yeah, it's everybody hates Hafez al-Assad, everybody hates Syria. Yeah. Hezbollah wasn't an issue, not a positive, not a negative issue back then. But you think it's actually interesting. Hezbollah, at least the way I remember it, was not a neutral word. Hariri was a bad word back then. To you, Hariri was bad. Yeah. You know, okay, let's let's cherry pick this. And I know it's not black and white. I mean, there's a lot of gray here. Hariri was good. Hezbollah was good too. Syria was bad. But you didn't say it that loud. And I'm talking about, نحن كنا بتلت الخيات وانا كنت بالأيسياس هون We'd see photos of Hafez al-Assad yamin and shmil but we wouldn't say You should have moved to Juni, you wouldn't see any photo of Hafez al-Assad Allah, it's that Where's my mom? She's somewhere here Oh, she left! <laughs> All right Oh, she's here still? Oh, she's smoking, fine <laughs> Yeah uh, but My that, wish now Sorry? That's my wish now, to, to smoke To smoke? It's fine <laughs> the, no, bra- the break is coming. It can wait. It can wait. Do we give permission to Jad to smoke? No, no, no. no, no, no. no. I don't. I, I don't want this. I need the no. owner to say yes, it, William. Yeah, it, it won't. It won't feel the same. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay. But that kind of Hezbollah is not really that important. But it's not a neutral word. It's the defender. It's fighting the Israelis. But I attribute this to being a kid. And not knowing more, and maybe it's a Hezbollah that no longer exists. It's a smaller, less important in terms of complete, less important in terms of leverage. It's a smaller group that's fighting the Israelis in the south. So Anna, as a teenager, my first political awakening is watching Kana on TV. And yeah, being, I have a vague memory of it, yes. That, to me, was... A pivoting it was very important to me that you can't criticize Hezbollah unless you adamantly oppose Israel but criticizing Hezbollah the way we talk about it now wasn't there Hariri and I, I like that this is the sort of this is dichotomy Hariri increasingly became a problematic story because he was becoming a little he was becoming part of it in other words this man did not have leverage he's talking about the back end of the 90s when he's out of parliament uh he's not prime minister anymore 98 98 but his 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 narrative is shifting too and maybe it's still too soon to see where it's going but there's this sort of maybe it's not the full picture look personally now knowing what i know uh, I, i don't have a very positive political view on rafi al-hariri mm. I don't demonize anybody. Mm. Not Hariri, not Jaja, not Nasrallah. Just mm. in politics, I believe that his uh, uh, his political and economic specifically bets failed uh, in 97. And rather than uh, searching for a different route, he doubled down, which was catastrophic. That's my point, point of view. But when I was talking about having a negative connotation to Rafi Hariri, From the circles in the 90s, it wasn't all of that. Right. It was yeah. something else. Yeah. It was also, it's in insinuations, you can you can understand it. Of what you were saying earlier. Yeah. The, yeah. That Rafi al-Hariri, what is this guy doing? Yeah. So, during the beginning of the 90s, maybe there was some fascination with a billionaire coming to Lebanon after a period of war, promising reconstruction. Okay. But then there is some sense of weariness. Of like, because this guy is taking all of the traditional functions of the Christians. He wears a tie, he speaks languages, he is a best friend with Jacques Chirac, the French president. He is uh, like, not controlling, but he has this umbrella over the private sector. All of these are the Christian mm. functions in mm. the pre-war Lebanon. Mm. So is it the Sunnis taking our functions away? Right. And I believe I used to live in Kaslik back then. Uh, and during the 90s, Kaslik was booming in terms of nightlife. 
there were pubs, there were nightclubs, and the fancy ones. Yeah. And suddenly, at the beginning of the year 2000, and later on, uh, Castique was losing this uh, function in favor of Beirut, definitely. Yeah. So the rhetoric back then uh, in June and Castique was that this is Rafi al Hariri, this is part of Rafi al Hariri plan to uh, take these functions out of us, to put it in Beirut. And as a teenager, you can sense this. No, no, it, that was that was taught to me bluntly. Uh, yeah, from but, friends I right, have. And, yeah. uh, and now looking back, that was stupid. <laughs> I, I'm against Rafi Hariri, but these are just yeah. uh, uh, fictitious. I, I can understand them because the memory was uh, thick back then, going out of the civil war, and everybody was frightful of everybody. Mm. But Juni and Kaslik won over these roles because Beirut was shut down because of the war. Yeah. So the, during the year 2000 and later on, Beirut as the capital of the country was requiring its yeah. habit, habitual functions. Right. We didn't have Juni as it is now as a big city before the civil war. <laughs> we used to go to Espes 2000, Espes de Mille during in the 90s. Yeah, because the cinemas here were not there. Yeah, yeah. We, Junie Kastik was vibrant back yeah. then. But because Beirut wasn't existing. Right. But let me, um, I want to follow this road yeah. a little further. Anna, 1996, on the rooftop in Tal al Khayyat, watching Apache helicopters shooting at Dahi, that was Syrian soldiers, Syrian checkpoints, Badal Mojuddin, Hon, Beirut. I could feel like there's, there's a right and wrong, but there's two wrongs too in this story. Maybe one is a little worse. That's how I saw it back then as a kid. Mm. The Israelis have to go. And the Syrians, it's a its a story for later, but Hezbollah is not yet the way we talk about it, at least right now. Yeah, definitely. To 2000. I remember going to the south, a really important day. And you could go to the south finally. You can go and see the border. You can touch the, the fence back then. You could actually throw things. I don't know if you guys remember this. We would throw watermelon. And a lot of us try to do this. Walid Fayyad tried to throw a stone recently. It didn't yeah. make it. We could make it. And we threw across the border. And the Israelis were sitting there watching us. That's, I'm maybe 18, 19 at the time. Proud. Proud of being Lebanese, but proud of Hezbollah. Now, this begins to change later for me. But I'm going to speculate at that moment in time. A lot of us felt the same way on these issues. Not really. No. Oh. Uh, back then, okay, in 2000, I was 14 years old. Uh, the, 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 the independence of the South wasn't an issue. It wasn't something to be neither proud. I'm, I'm talking about the circles that yeah, we yeah, live. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's nothing. Okay, let's see what does that mean. So you were skeptical, but it wasn't the issue that I believe it should have been. Mm. It's not something uh, silly. It's something. And I, I didn't, we didn't have any position towards Israel. And I can understand that back then. Mm. The Christian regions going out of the civil war, uh, their enemy wasn't Israel. I know on TV no one wants to say that, mm. but that's the truth. I I later on learned about what is Israel politically speaking and the threats that the Zionist ideology carries with it. That I learned on. Uh, uh, I wasn't a teenager. I had to learn that. And recently, recently, two years ago, I had a discussion with a, the mother of a friend. She's from the south. Uh, and she was telling me stories with the Israeli occupation because her hometown was occupied and they, have, they had to live under occupation for decades. Yeah. Uh, I was seeing the parallels with the stories I've, I've heard about the Syrians. Right. Some people were kidnapped. They had uh, hawajis on the streets. Uh, they were harassing people, harassing ladies. Uh, some people were killed. 
So these are the same stories, but, but in this country, our problem is that we don't share the same connotations of the terms that we use. So if someone from the South talk about Israel, it rings another way if I'm hearing that coming from Juni. Yeah. And if he hears about Syria from a guy living in Juni, it rings another bell. It doesn't mean the same thing emotionally or historically. And that's a big rift. And I think also it's it's important. Maybe this is where social media doesn't work in that there's perspective. These words did not mean the same thing all the time. Yeah, definitely. Whether it's even Syria or Hezbollah or a man like Michel Hon. Can I give you an example about something? Sure. How the terms have different meaning given different eras and different political perspectives. During the 90s, I remember that the official political stance of the Lebanese state, of the Syrian state, was that towards the Israeli issue. That was the official state. So anything less than that was problematic. Yeah. Anything more was okay, Muzayadet. It's not something serious. Mm. Now, move 20 years later. If an official, it happened with Gibran Basile, he said that uh, salam, adil Israel. Well, it's not ideological. Kaza. He was harassed for it. Yeah. So what changed? It's the same political rhetoric that Hafiz al-Assad used to say. It's not about the uh, local political players. It was yeah. Syria. Yeah. So what changed is that Syria's role diminished yeah. and Hezbollah's role grew. And there's a special period of time both of us share together because we're both, at least in our teenage years, I'm seven or eight years older than you, but we're, we're coming into our own. The early 2000s, when all of us were talking about Michel Aoun, all the time early 2000s leading up to 2004 ah, al, uh, when congress and uh, all of that stuff 1559 the things that are happening abroad and he becomes he's part of the scene again without being here syria accountability act and stuff syria like accountability that. act and he's there's that sense that he is going to one day come back while Jaja is still in jail, we're talking about Michel Aoun. Mm. It's almost like these characters are resurfing, resurfacing slowly. But I will say from my side, there was a positive connotation to Michel Aoun. He yeah. was fighting the noble fight abroad, even when, maybe now looking back, we know that's not exactly the whole story. Yeah, but both Jaja Aoun and even Jmail had some kind of positive connotations in the Shari. Yeah, and Jmail was gone too. Yeah. At that time, he came back in two thousand. In two, his kids, I think, in ninety eight. Yeah, he ran to the elections in two thousand, and he right. won. And he won. But Michel Hon, that name is not the name that we share right now. Yeah. It's a different person. Maybe it's the same person in his mind, but I don't think we engage him nearly the same way anymore. It he can't be the same person, even for those who are still in the FPM and they are uh, partisans. Yeah. They have, okay, this uh, admiration, I don't know what to call it, but it's not the same. It's not the same. Uh, back then, the figures of Samir Jaja and Michel Aoun were mythic. Yeah. It's like Fairuz, you don't see her, you don't hear from her, you just know about her. And right. She, just, she's great. In the, but, but I don't know how to call it in English, uh, nifaq. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. There were always hypocrisy about this uh, unification of the Christians because mm, back then, Uwait, yeah. Wauniye, uh, uh, and Kataib are all against the Syrians and they are all out of the political scene and supposedly they were working together. Yeah, I was in school and I was in university. They hated each other for silly reasons. Uh, who is in power more in the student cabinets and stuff like that. Yeah. It was always, it's an ongoing issue. But they were trying not to make it appear on the surface. But Michel Aoun was really on his own in terms of being the loudest, most vocal, anti-Assad, anti-Hezbollah critic abroad. And we were watching him here. Sometimes censored, sometimes not. 
but he was he was a bulldozer abroad and that's true mm. he came back in that fashion but it's something about 2005 that both of us share this is a shift that happens very quickly but it's a shift that we both at least in its inception agreed to which is everything we've been talking about suddenly is being demonstrated against on the streets maybe it's not being said directly i don't remember hasbullah being part of the march 14 protest we weren't saying hasbullah no it wasn't an issue it was we're syria saying, we're saying syria right and maybe after reflection and maybe that's the benefit of now looking back is that hasbullah is part of the story but we're saying syria and we're calling on the syrians to leave and you and I, I think at least if we were old enough, I, I was, I think we both would have been on the streets probably together. I was. You were too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, in the 14th of March demonstrations. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. I would. We were in the even tents before the 14th of March. Yeah. Uh, used to sleep there. And I remember one night uh, someone uh, awakened me. I was sleeping in the streets. I was sleeping uh, beside the mosque. And uh, back then, it, there was like with the hadid, and there was a door that came It's not like it is now. So someone it was the me tent. Up. Yeah, yeah, it was a tent, yeah. uh, a steel tent. Yes. Uh, something is happening. Something is happening. And we went uh, there. It was Naila Mawad making a speech. No faratu, faratu, am yistailu, and uh, it was not right. There was just Farid Al Khazin that resigned from the government back then. So yes, it was a momentous uh, a period f for me, uh, me and many uh, thousands of people in Lebanon. Yep. But I believe that the, the problem with it is the problem that we have now. It's not backed by a clear political project. We know what we are against. We don't know what we are for. And you are seeing politicians that were part of the Syrian regime in Lebanon whitewashing themselves. But you're seeing them as allies because now they are the good talking uh, loudly on TVs that they want the series out we were dreaming of something like that happening yeah uh, but we weren't no we, we didn't have a clue what's going to happen and it was based on a very like, uh, basic premise that all of our problems were from the Syrians once they will go out we can rule ourselves and I believe that was the biggest mistake not all of our problems were from the Syrians. In fact, in this political system, the stability that you need for this kind of a political system, that's why I'm against it, is that you need the Syrians here or any other hegemonic power. But let me interrupt you because I, I really, I want to bring us to today uh. as quickly as I can from this thread. What did you think about Hezbollah on March 14, 2005? Nothing. Hezbollah, Hezbollah's uh, image grew uh, during the July War of 2006. Right. Before that, Hezbollah, even the, 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 the person of Hassan Nasrallah, I remember watching the news. People can meet them. Uh, the, the politicians go to his uh, headquarters, wherever he is. He used to visit the uh, uh, Mufti. He used to go and he was in Bishari, in the Christian areas. Hezbollah was ridiculed a little bit. He was compared to the uh, old uh, Palestinian small uh, militias that just sent a couple mm. of like uh, Katyusha, yeah. and that's it. It's it's just for the for the posture. It wasn't something greedy. Really. Uh, serious. I believe that the July War of 2006, um, no, this is a serious power, mm. militarily speaking. Yeah. That was the moment that changed Hezbollah. I cannot generalize. I'm always saying Shari and uh, at least uh, heck, a diverse group of my entourage being Uwet or Auni or Kateb. But I think that was the heck sense around me did it change in a positive way or a negative way for me or for the general thinking for you no no for me it was a uh, very positive uh, positive uh, oof. it was that was the first time that uh, i really was in contact with any kind of real war mm. because the civil war okay i was born in 86 
but it ended in the 90s. I was four years old. It's not a political memory. It's mm. something maybe I even remember some images. I don't remember being frightful or having a stake. Mm. I was just a kid. Yeah. I mean, no consciousness. The 2006 war opened up two things for me back then. Okay, One should dwell on the Israeli question a lot more just to understand what, what is this thing, why it is an issue, and I don't want to be part of these slogans uh, that uh, heck, minimize any issue to slogans, stuff like that. One should understand, is it a threat? Why it is a threat? How we should we deal with it? And what is the threat in it, if it is? July 2006 for me, I'm living in Hamra, a building that's gone. I'm working at Zico House with a group called Samidun, which yeah. I didn't know was a communist collective. And I'm doing hygiene kit distribution to the schools around Beirut, working with them in Oxfam for a month. I'm younger, I'm thinner, I'm a little more optimistic in life. Spending day in, day out, distributing hygiene kits to all the displaced Lebanese from the south. And I'm, I'm guessing you were in junior during 2006. No, I went to, because I was in uh, the Lebanese University in Jaladib, and there were refugees coming uh, to Matin and everywhere. So uh, I was helping uh, the refugees in the that, that came and slept in the university mm. because we stopped the university definitely. And it was there was hundreds of people b- there, and they were trying to bring food and uh, first aid stuff and stuff. So we're both doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, July 2006, my impression of Hezbollah turns negative, not positive. Okay, because uh, he was the instigator of the war. It's that the other things that were burdening us, they're not, the, they're not everything, but that pressure on our backs, a lot of it was lifted following April 2005 when the Syrians left. Mm felt like a pressure cooker had finally stopped. But suddenly there's this other group that's inheriting something that they didn't used to control before, which is really the terms of war on their terms only. And yes, maybe part of it, part of it, is that that summer war was Hezbollah's for responsibility, meaning that instigation led to a huge Israeli retaliation. And you can't compare the Israelis, the, the amount of damage they cause, and comparing what Hezbollah causes to Israel, it's disproportionate in, its, in, in many ways, in every way. But that, that war shouldn't have happened. And had all of us been on board in decision-making, that war would not have happened. But it's this kind of moment of maybe Hezbollah is not what we thought it was before. Maybe it's something bigger. Definitely, the the, 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 the scale issue is, uh, it got to the surface and for me at least in the July War of 2006. Back then, my understanding was that uh, because I was an FPM back then and they had their understanding yeah. uh, before the war, maybe four months, uh, I didn't see Hezbollah as a threat, but it wasn't a really well thought of political idea. Mm. It was the rhetoric of the FPM, and you just internalize it and we go with it. Now, if you ask me about it, uh, I I don't really see any point in talking about if he has the right or if he doesn't have the right. Because, okay, we can talk theoretically, no one has the right but the state. Mm. In real life, how does the state come to be? What is a state? Used to learn in political science about the social contract. People go to get together and they have a social contract where they uh, are relieved of some of their freedoms in order to organize their social being for us to live together peacefully. Okay, that's that's abstractions. This mm. is theoretical. That's not how things are in real life. States come to be usually from a violent act of a group of citizens. 
that have something in common. It can be the identity, it can be a class group or whatever. And they impose a form of a state. It's imposed. And with time, it's either or. Either this state apparatus that came to be with force, with power, has the legitimacy of its citizens. Hmm. So with time and with some struggles, social struggles, the violent apparatus of the state is being diminished because its legitimacy doesn't need to apply force and violence, brute violence, all the time. Or it doesn't get this legitimacy from the people and you will have some form of inqilab, sawra or whatever. The problem that we have in Lebanon where these questions about Hezbollah, Munazamta al-Tahrir al-Falastiniyi, Al-Uwat al are never-ending questions is because we don't have the playground that can and in, can enforce a form of a state. It's, but I'm, I'm trying to see how our thoughts are evolving almost like two different people experiencing the same story but coming to different conclusions yeah so it's already nice to know that we're seeing but diff- back then i didn't have these ideas back then these ideas started evolving i believe from 2009 onwards then let me jump ahead because I'd, I'd like to only add one more thing from 2006 to 2008 the impression of what hasbullah used to be at least to me and maybe i'm guessing a lot of beirutis then was that this group can also paralyze government and it can lead a protest and a sit-in and it can also do something else that it promised it would never do, yeah, Tur- turn its weapons inwards. But what changed back then, what, what the change is, yeah. the change in perspective. Because if you are an FPM supporter back then, the paralysis is coming from the Senora government. So that's yeah. So we're seeing okay. So it's, yeah. it's, so it's, a, it's right. a different outlook, like yes. the, the the woman in the south seeing the yeah. Israelis and someone in the north seeing the Syrians. Paralysis. Some uh, you're seeing it as senora instigated, or not you? But let's say the FPM. Yeah, yeah, FPM. yeah not you. Because the, back then, Michel Aoun was one of the few that refused the Hilf al Rubai. Right. Exactly. So he was out of the 14th of March, and the senora had his government. The formation of the government excluded the FPM from the national unity government, right. and the, uh, uh, the 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 problem was al Hasas Faliyan. And you're right. Six seven months later, there's Tifet Madam Khayel, and then a year later, there's Harib Tammuz. No, less than a year. Tifet Madam Khayel was no. in February. Tammuz was in Tammuz. So, sorry, uh, a July. year. Sorry, sorry, a year Five after months. the elections. Sorry, oh, yeah, yeah. And I'll just. I mean, it's not meant to be. I'm trying to remember it vividly. It's the World Cup. Italy wins. Yes. And then two days, three days later, the war begins. Mm. And I guess from my side, I saw that as this is a completely unnecessary war. A month later, it's over. In May 2008, I'm hiding in Hamra from Hezbollah's allies that are shooting. Not just Hezbollah, of course. There's all types of people shooting at each other. But... There's a war happening on the streets of Hamra. Anna, for me, Hamra, when? May 2008. Ah, uh, uh, But May 7, yeah. May 7. But that is something that I think I cannot remove from the story too. Even though you said 2009 is your start, I think of May 2008 as that's the end. Hezbollah is not what I used to think it was. Hezbollah is something else. We're going to Doha to solve our problems. During this period, I was uh, uh, beginning my transition from the acquired thoughts of the FPM to trying to analyze what's going on. Something is wrong here. Mm. Sabah Ayar definitely, uh, even though, to be really frank, Sabah Ayar wasn't the main issue because I was expecting it. I, I think everybody was expecting this 14th and 8th of March yeah. will bl- blow out somehow, some way. But how it ended? Uh, Doha and everybody goes together in a plane uh, after all the dead people and they agree on everything in three days. And we've been on the streets since since 2005, three years. 
I know friends, someone he's now paralyzed because he was shot during the Talat al Aswad. I don't know if you remember, 2007. And this is how it ended. So why being so engaged in politics if mm. everything is from the top down and doesn't follow any linear uh, uh, logic? Yeah? yeah. So that was the moment for me to reassess everything. And I left the FPM in 2012, but I really internally was out of it gradually during 2009 and 2012. That this the decision to cut off needed something to happen, and back then Sherbil Nahas's uh, resignation happened. Yes, right. And this I, I didn't know Sherbil Nahas back then, but this is what okay. Everything now is uh, opportunistic politics. Mm. It's, it's, there, there is no uh, principled linear like, logic in it. So I left. I'm not going to repeat anything we talked about in our earlier yeah. episodes. I'm going to skip over that. But I'll just put it in perspective that the assassinations completely changed my understanding of Hezbollah for something that cannot exist the way it does today. And I won't repeat what we talked about earlier. But you fast forward until 2019. You and I are back on the streets together. Well. So you take that whole journey... October 17, 2019, after all those governments, after national unity in Doha, after all those mini battles, after a July war, after Hadidi's exit and return, after the string of assassinations, and then you and I are sharing a similar cause, which I think is a profound part of this story. And this only means something. You and I are not, we're not that different. We're all showing up when the demonstrations are happening. We are all different and we are all the same. That's that's life. I, I don't believe that we are different at all. And we have different perspectives. We have different experiences. And this will frame your thought. Definitely. But, but I want to bring this opportunity up to say something else. And I'll let you, uh, I'll let you say it the way you do. I couldn't shake Hezbollah from October 17, from day one. And I saw this as this this moment and everything lining up to this moment, it all depends on Hezbollah. Not the Hezbollah that maybe we talk about in terms of loose conversations, meaning that subject is the thing that was not solved when you and I were on the streets on March 14. And that is going to kill this. And I, I don't know if we can get into this maybe, but... That could have been a premature assumption, but I felt it. Look, I have a big problem with Hezbollah, uh, specifically from the moment of the financial collapse and onwards, for lots of issues. But I can't blame Hezbollah for uh, ruining the 17th of October moment or demonstrations, because you, you can't expect from your political rival, opponent, or whatever, to give you any passes. Th these demonstrations were anti-systemic, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Mm. The system saw them as a threat. Mm. They wouldn't and shouldn't, if they are smart, deal with it otherwise, another way that they did. The problem comes from the other side. The problem lies within. How can we evolve our revolts to a revolution? We are a population prone to revolt, not for political activism, long-term political activism. We are weary, weary of political parties. We are weary of political engagement. We are weary of politics in general. Deep down, if you have a long discussion with most people back then during the demonstrations, the expectation was that every cross-national big demonstration such as this is entitled to win or to have the government resign, the politicians will go away. Unfortunately, this is not real life. Because these politicians also are 
rooted in the society. Mm. We don't have dictators here. We have some uh, populist uh, autocrats, but they have they have popular backing. We have panderers to Hezbollah from March 14 and March 8. We have opponents to Hezbollah that are on the margins. And we have a lot of independent voices, and I think a lot of them are October 17 born, that want to see the dilemma in a way that's more unified. And I think, I think, I can, I can offer this analogy. I know that it's not all about Hezbollah, and I know that Hezbollah is not the only problem. And if we remove that security problem, we're going to have a lot of other things to worry about anyway. I think that's a true statement. But the problem with this assertion is yeah. that it negates how how real life politics goes. I'll, I'll say the real. That's what I wanted to touch on. Real life to me is tayuni. To me, real life is seeing the end of Tare Bitar's career in a moment. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Th- these are all the problems that takes me back to May 2008. It takes me back to everything that happened since you and I were on the streets the first time. I know, I know Tare Bitar cannot do more. No, no, no. Look, I I have a a, a clear perspective. Maybe you don't agree with it or you do, but I I, I thought about it too much. Yeah. The question of Hezbollah, the question of the country in general, the problem that we have here is that Hezbollah or any other political party than, than Hezbollah we will have a Hezbollah in Lebanon. You think so? Yeah, yeah. And, and any time, any country, any society that you don't have a hege- hegemonic state mm. that enforces that no one can rival its functions, that will happen. Ask yourself a question. Why we in Lebanon have a military group other than the state? Why not Syria? Why not Egypt? I'm talking about the uh, mm. dual al-Tawq, well mm. Israel. Mm. Why only Lebanon? Because no other state will allow for this to happen in a violent manner. So many times, it's not about autocracy or democracy. Mm. If you try and challenge the legitimacy of the state in the US, you will get crushed. Mm. So you can remember it's Trump. Okay, Trump is a a controversial figure, but any other president, I believe, will do the same, will speak differently. When they had the Black Lives Matter and they thought these demonstrations can really uh, uh, contest the legitimacy of the institutions that were, especially the police, Trump said to the governor, if you don't break these demonstrations down, I will make the National Army get into your state and do the job for you. So the the violence gets out of politics when hegemony is has popular legitimacy behind it. Maybe we're speaking the same language then, but looking at it as if we're two passengers in the same car looking at different sides of the car. I see the Israeli occupation and the Syrian occupation as having destroyed a lot of what we dreamed about. And I don't think Hezbollah is an Iranian occupation, but I think Hezbollah is playing the same role in that Lebanon will not breathe the way it should. And I think, this is hypothetical, unless the structural problems are solved with that, yeah, you could have another paramilitary group, but I don't see one naturally coming to the fruition within. I think Hezbollah is really the last chapter. But do you think that any uh, path towards building a state can happen without answering the questions, not answering in, 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 in words, practically answering all of the questions of the functions of the state. So when they took on me that video that I was saying, hmm. what was I saying? If you are the only political party that is militarized at least to that extent some yeah. people can know to okay small militias if you have the biggest parliamentary bloc and back then in 2018 parliament they had the majority as eight yep. many other mm-hmm. okay you have the responsibility to rule the country that's why they're not an occupation 
And I think I completely agree. That's exactly They what don't want to rule it because right. they know that then politics might come with something that they don't want. Right. Responsibility. Which is, or the state. The state for it. State meaning responsibility. So the, it, if Hezbollah is yeah. ruling the government alone. Yeah. yeah. And something happens in Tripoli. Hezbollah has to answer to that. Right. He cannot throw it on Al Hariri, Ruhallah. Exactly. That's what Hezbollah doesn't want. Right. Why? Because Hezbollah isn't any different of any other confessional party in this country. They want to have a rule over Manatun mm. and have a share of the government to guarantee Hakmul That is That's where it. that is where I think, and I know we ran out of time a while ago. Um, I think that is where the two roads meet. I agree. The local Hezbollah is exactly the way you're describing it. Iran's Hezbollah is what's destroying Lebanon. And I think that both both statements can be true. I, I can agree, but the problem with the terms, I, I don't like to use the, maybe it's a fault of mine, I will never win an election, I know. But destroying Lebanon isn't a task done by any specific one party. Hmm. It's a political system that they all agree on. Rafiq Hariri didn't have a problem with Hezbollah when Hezbollah was playing to the standards of the game, giving the terms back then. Knowing that Hezbollah is a military party, knowing that when you have a military party that is contesting the military apparatus of the state, Hukman, it's like this. Yeah. But when you are out of the government, when you don't uh, rival our political shares from the government, okay, there is the Syrian that can guarantee that. You're there, I'm here, it's fine. Mm, mm. So my problem is that when you demonize a specific political party, is absolving all of the others of all of their uh, responsibilities that is still being shared to this day Not from Najib Mi'ate, from Michel Aoun, from Samir Jaja, from all of them, when they tackle politics in a way that cannot answer to our problem. I agree. Cannot. I agree. Our political system is dysfunctional with or without Hezbollah. Not Hezbollah, the political party. I think that's where you and I meet. We're not. It's not the same word. It's not necessarily the same meaning. Not Hezbollah, the MPs. Actually, they may even be less corrupt than other MPs. Not that. Actually, I'll say it differently. Look, I, I'll say. Oh, sorry, and I'll, I'll give you the last words before we leave it to Q and A. You'll have the floor. What I mean is, had Hezbollah not been a militia post May 2000, I think we would have been in a much better place. I don't think they're can, the can reason you, they're repeat, not, uh, Had Hezbollah yeah. let go of their leverage that they had during the civil war until the Israelis left. Shabbat farms with or without Shabbat. That I think had that chapter ended in Hezbollah as a political party, they may have been one of the better ones today. Yeah, but I believe that is a not realist thing to ask. Hmm. In politics, there are functions. There is finance and distribution. There is internal uh, security. There is security to the borders. And acquiring these functions will give you political leverage that any political party or militia or whatever will try to do. You cannot have a void and expect that no one will fill that void. Having an armed apparatus, a void in the armed apparatus of the, uh, of the state. If you know that the Lebanese army, which is supposed to defend the country against exterior enemies, not interior, they are not interior, uh, interior yeah. security forces. Yeah, they were assigned by the government in 1991 and it's still till this day by the task of internal security because of exceptional reasons we are going. And it's still there. And we see the Lebanese army between yeah. us yeah. all the time. If you go to any country in the world, you cannot see the army. But they you never see the army. That's true. But they weren't in the south from May 2000 until July 2006. That is also part of the story. I agree with you. They, they weren't in the South from the Civil War until now. But exactly. So which were dealing with the Israelis. You're right. It was a different issue. You're right. But post-Israeli withdrawal, Lebanese army is not in the South. I don't believe we have a Lebanese army. 
You know, you remind me. You remind me actually. Interior forces. Yeah, this is the, why both of us took for us. I, I will just finish with <laughs> yes. uh, with one word because yeah. I don't see things with their symbolic appearance. Yes, definitely we have a Lebanese army and we have uh, uh, great people who sacrificed their lives doing what they had to do. Yeah. Functionally, we don't have an army that can restrict any other force to rival it, and we don't have a Lebanese army that can fight exterior forces. Neither we can fight Syria, neither we can fight Israel. So anyone who can fill this void is not expected just to land you this leverage. It's, it's not expected. The question is what to do. When you have the situation, but asking Hezbollah and Muslim Islehak, I believe it's it's, it's nothing. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, that's why the story is not here. I agree. The story is with what Iran wants from this group. What, I agree. What do and, we want from each other? Oh, I think I know what we want from each other. I think because we've we've talked about that before. We want a state that functions in a more efficient and noble way that's decent to its citizens but the problem is what does that mean this I, is a political problem and we can't we can agree or disagree yeah, and that, it's a political process that's normal but I, i'm going to and I'll, I'll again i should just let you finish this uh i don't think we want a sub-state group involved in our history and i i think you've said that in different ways before I'm not going to speak on your behalf, but I've heard you say no, that. No, definitely. But I just add, and I know this because some people doesn't like this logic, but that is what I have. I believe that all of these political parties that we have are sub-state actors, and they take out of the functions of the state too much. I believe that whenever is needed, Walid blood can control a region whenever is needed. Whenever is needed, some Christian parties, maybe the Lebanese forces more than others because they are more organized, can take control and with impunity as Walid blood As other forces, the problem with Hezbollah is a problem of scale, not, not of nature. Hezbollah in nature is like each and every other confessional party we have حزب طائفي شيعي عم يشتغل على جماعته بمنطقته بسكيل ايه في مصاري اكثر في سلاح اكثر في عقيده اكثر في تنظيم اكثر that's the hezbollah i grew up with in the 90s that's the hezbollah i remember not the one we live with right now the other groups you mentioned can absolutely and they don't and the lebanese are don't they're not uh, Samir Jaja, for all I know, is not a military threat to Hezbollah. Okay. It's, okay. it's a matter of scale. It's a huge matter of scale. And when there's armed groups that could pose a threat, either to the army or Hezbollah, they're still dealt with. For the most part, not really. I, I don't see a security threat in a, in a real way to that group. And I think... I mean, Nothing equates to Hezbollah in terms of a security threat, in terms of scale. The reason I'm but not... The reason when, I'm, when we talk about impunity, yeah. let's talk Tayuni. No one will get any real judicial process because there are two political parties ahead of the two people, two groups that gunned each other. At the same time, I believe that no one, uh, Abrushmoon, between Walid Jumblat and Talal Irslan and Gibran Basil, there are people who were killed and no one was imprisoned or sentenced or whatever. Go back to uh, Wiam Wahab when he shot Fir'a al Malumet's guys. Neither from Fir'a al Malumet or from Wiam Wahab's guys because you have political impunity in Lebanon. I will end it by saying this and I'll open it up to Q&A without a break if that's okay. We can go straight to q and I'll let you go home early. I'm sorry we've overstepped your time. Yeah, I just uh, send a message to my wife. Is that okay? Yeah, All right. Fine. We can give the audience a two-minute bathroom this, break. This is a security threat. That's a security threat. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, can, we can go on. I agree and... with you. <laughs> All right. So thank you for that, Jad. I'll... I, I, you remind me of the way I experienced Fawaz Trabulsi's class. Mm. <laughs> really, it's the it's the students that were not able to talk in the classroom. They were listening to Fawaz Trabulsi, 
But I think there was always this background chatter of people trying to understand Lebanon at its core. And I hear you. I hear you saying, in a way, it's like, it's an additional path in that, yes, Tayuni happens because Tarbitar does something. And perhaps it's right that, yes, a lot of groups in Lebanon, so long as this status quo persists, could revert and maybe have the know-how, some of them used to do it, into something that could be a security threat. But I think the status quo and the paralysis that both of us have grown up in has taken too much of our time. And I think it's robbed us a lot of this generation's potential. And it's the reason why I think there aren't that many people like us doing this. A lot of the decent minds that once did this are either gone or dead. Yeah, yeah I believe everyone is, uh, is fleeing the country because there's no... Yeah. There's no there's no horizon. And I want any solution. But there is a sort of a horizon. It's what you're doing, meaning that you're narrating the story. I'm doing it my way. Sure. And the fact that we can meet occasionally and do this together means the world to me. No, it means a lot. So I want to thank I, I love these discussions knowing that they are really heavy ones. I want to thank your wife for giving you permission <laughs> to stick <laughs> I want around. To thank her. I want to thank the audience for listening to, I think, two-hour conversation. There's a five-minute break. Order, use the bathroom. We'll open it up to Q&A. Thank you. And I have to leave Max at 10. Max at 10. So guys, we're going to start the Q&A. Jad doesn't have that much time. So if you could, please keep the questions short and let Jad speak as long as he needs to. I'll ask one small favor. If you could introduce yourselves, uh, just say who you are, what you do. It would be great to get to know you better. So uh, it will begin and then he'll be the mic man after. So go ahead. Well, Talib, I'm a journalist at L'Oreal today, the English section of L'Oreal Jewel. I have two short questions for Jad, but the answer to them might be complicated. And I should say that these questions don't necessarily reflect my opinion. I'm just curious about what you think about them. Yeah. So the first question is, um, are you for normalizing relationship with Syria, consider, uh, taking into consideration that its regime is not the most fair regime out there? And my second, and considering that Lebanon might have an interest in that, my second question is, are you for a peace deal with Israel, considering that Lebanon might have an interest uh, with a no state of war with any country? Do I answer? Or? I, if they're, t- they're for Jad, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, can I answer in Arabic? It would be quicker. Please. Okay. Uh, 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 first thing, with Syria, the work depends on the place that you talk about. موقعي انا كشخص عايش بالبلد وكذا بتمنى نظام مختلف بسوريا نظام يكون ديمقراطي في حريات مثل ما بتمنى هون بالبلد وهيدا بيطمني اكثر لعلاقات اراده المجتمعين بتكون ماخوذه بعين الاعتبار بالنظامين السياسيين مش معقول يجي خبريه مسقط علينا عليهم وعلينا من فوق ساعتها بتصير القصه مرتبطه بمين بيجي ومين بيروح وبيضل بحاله خطر اما اذا انا عم بحكي بموقع سلطه اذا انا صرت بموقع سلطه انا ما شغلتي تو ليكتشر بقيه الدول على انظمتها والا رح هي تو ليكتشر مي على نظامي ويصير المنطلق اللي انا من خلاله بدي اعمل علاقات الخارجيه يستعملوه معي وانا كدوله صغيره بموازين القوى اضعف الدوله اللبنانيه علي تحدد شو مصالحها العليا وساعتها بتعرف بدها تقيس أنا إذا بدي أعمل اقتصاد بشكل معين، شو نوع السلع اللي بدي صدرها؟ بدي صدرها عبر البر ولا عبر البحر؟ إذا البر ما بيعني لها خالص، 
وبتقدر تتحمل قطع العلاقات مع سوريا تروح إذا البر بيعني لو البحر غالي كثير لتقدر تورد بضاعة محلات وتكون كومباتيتف لتقدر تبيعها ليصير عندك اقتصاد وعندك مجتمع يقدر يكمل هون ساعتها بدك تروح وتحكي مع سوريا وهون بده واحد يشوف شو عنده أسيتس بهذا الحديث وشو في أسيتس لخصمه لأنه كل الدول أخصام ما في حدا بيحب الثاني ولا في دولة شقيقة ولا في إخوة بس قادر أنت تخلق علاقات عقلانية أنا إذا بتسألني رأيي الشخصي بموقع سلطة بتمنى أقدر أوصل لمحل ما تكون العلاقات اللي بدها تعملها الدولة اللبنانية إيذر أور يعني إذا أنا مضطر أعمل علاقات مع سوريا بده يسكر علي الخليج وإذا بدي أعمل علاقات مع الخليج بده يسكر علي سوريا هذا اللي بتمناه وأنا برأيي مع السلطة السياسية القائمة بلبنان هذا مستحيل لأنه إذا السلطة بلبنان هي مؤلفة من زعماء هن رعاية لدول خارجية ما في دولة خارجية بتوسق بزعيم منه زلمته لأنه بعرف رح يكون زلمة خصمة ورح يستخدم الأرض اللبنانية صراع ساحة صراع بين هالقوى الإقليمية هون من هون بصير بحاجة لنظام مختلف بحدد الأطراف السياسيين اللي بيتمنوا يخوضوا العمل السياسي بده ينزلوا على انتخابات ويعملوا وزراء شو مصلحة لبنان تعرف شو علاقاته الخارجية اللي بتخدم هالمصلحة هيدي بخصوص سوريا سو so ديبيندز على البرسبكتيف بخصوص اسرائيل انا مني مع سلام مع اسرائيل لسبب كثير بسيط انا لا بدي صلي بالقدس ولا بالكنيسة القيامه ولا المسجد الاقصى ولا بيعني لي حوار الاديان هذا كله حديث للاستهلاك السياسي وللمزايدات لناس بقى تحمل القضيه الفلسطينيه للمزايده انا بمنطق كثير بسيط انا ح... سوريا محتل البلد فتره من الفترات بس بسوريا ما في نظام ايديولوجي بس بعد ياخذوا ايديولوجيته هو علماني وهو قومي عربي وكذا وهذا منه الواقع. السعوديه عندها مصالح بلبنان بس نظام كمان بيشتغل على المصلحه القوميه منه ايديولوجي. اسرائيل بالنسبه لي انا في نظام حدي حاكمته عقيده اسمها صهيونيه زيونيزم. بس بطلب من الناس لانه هلا كمان الصهيونيه صارت كلمه بتلعن النفس قد ما مستهلكه بالمزايدات السياسية والقوى الصهيونية وكذا واحد بينسى شو هي الصهيونية يعني بيصير كأنه أنه كل شيء اسمه إسرائيل وصهيون أما كل شيء يهود صهيون صهيونية هي عقيدة سياسية محددة في يهود التزموا فيها وفي كتير يهود ما التزموا فيها وأغلب اليهود البروغرسيف بالعالم هن أنتي زيونست نحن مسأبنا في زيونست ستيت حدنا وكمان أيامنا هلأ يمين اليمين عم يحكم فيها هيدي العقيدة ما فيك تعيش مع ما فيك تتعايش مع من دون خوف دائم لأنه هي عقيدة بتشبه إلى حد كتير كبير مع فروقات بالتشبيه كمان من نزية The stratify society وبصير كل واحد بهالستراتيفيكيشن عنده وظائف بخدمة شعب أساس هن هن وكل حلال عندهم يعني شو بيصير بالعرب تبع 48 اللي جوات اسرائيل ومعهم جنسيه اسرائيليه هيدا فونكسيونال بالنسبه لوجودي الي بموت ناس بحرك مجتمع بكحت عالم هيدا كله حلال فهيدي دوله عقائديا انا ما في اتعايش معها خصوصا اذا انا عقائديا معتبر انه الناس كلها بغض النظر شو بتخلق بتخلق سني وشيعه ويهودي واللي بدك اياه هن متساويين بخلقتهم بحقوقهم بواجباتهم مش هيك انا مع دولة علمانية يعني فهيدا المنطق هو نقيد لهيدا المنطق كيف اذا المنطق اليهود الصهاينة اللي اجوا كونوا هالدولة كونوها على اساس دولة عسكرية يعني هو كل توحيد القومية الاسرائيلية هي توحيد عسكري يعني هلا تنشوف قديش نحن بنقعد نقبر بعض هون بين السنة والشيعة والموارنة وكذا انه مكونات انه هو ما بيجتمعوا بدك زعيمك يقبل انه يقعد مع زعيمه تالمجتمع يقدر يعيش سوا بس يتذكر كيف كونوا دولة اسرائيل من خلال هجرة معاكسة اجا بولندي يهودي اجا روسي يهودي اجا مغربي يهودي اجا سوري يهودي فرنساوي امريكاني ما بيحكوا نفس اللغة في ناس ما بيحكوا نفس اللغة وحتى مذهبيا جوات اليهود عقائديا ما لهم نفس الشيء اجت المؤسسة العسكرية وبظرف هلا فينا نطلع صار عمرهم 80 سنه 
صاروا دولة يمينية متطرفة مستعدة يموتوا أهلا تيدافعوا عنا وهن جايين من هالباك جراوند ولا واحد تاني بيعرف يحكي مع التاني بتصور هيدا خطورته المشروع مشان هيك أنا مني مع السلام هلا هل هيدا يعني إنه أنا مع حالة حرب مفتوحة ديسبايت موازين القوى لا أنا حدا كتير عقلاني وبراجماتيك بعرف حدودي بهيدي اللعبة بس أنا بعرف وين المخاطر اللي بتجي على مجتمعي وما في إذا في مخاطر بقى تجي على تكوين المجتمع المتعدد تبعي من حد عنده مصلحه يقول انه يهوديه الدوله اساس اذا يهوديه الدوله اساس يعني الطوائف تكون دول من منطق انا برايي عنصري هيدي عدو فكريه الي ما بقدر اعيش معه ليتس جو تو ذا ميدل يس ذا جنتلمان وذ ذا بلاك شيرت هاي محمد الحاج سوفت وير ديفلوبر Uh, سؤالي بده بس سمول اكسبلانيشن نحن عندنا فكره انه حزب الله هو اكبر عقده بالبلد مش هي العقده الاساسيه بس لحتى نحل باقي العقد لازم نشيل هالشغله اول شيء لحتى نقدر نفضل الباقيين سمول اكزامبل انه كل الناس ما فينا نعمل شيء حزب الله سمول اكزامبل ف برايكم كيف بده يصير تفكيك حزب الله بشكل انه يضل جزء من الدولة اللبنانية بدل ما يكون اكزايلد منا وبذات الوقت كيف بدنا نعملها بشكل انه ما يصير في باور فاكيوم يفوتوا بين الناس عليها ويبلشوا يتخانقوا بين بعض عليها. Do you want to answer this one? You start and I'll answer. انا بالنسبة لي الحديث اللي دائما بينحكى على التلفزيونات تحديدا عن شيء بيتسمى لبنانة حزب الله، يعني لبنانة خياراته السياسية، يعني المنطلق اللي بيتحرك من خلاله ما يكون اقليمي، يكون لبناني، الاند ريزالت اللي بده اياه، بتصير من خلال وهذا اللي كنا عم نطرحه بوقت الانتخابات انه اذا لابد في صراع مجدي مع حزب الله هو صراع على العناوين السياسية وغاياتها. يعني أنا اليوم إذا بعمل صراع مع حزب الله على التلفزيونات إنه سلم سلاحك ما ما لا بيقدم ولا بيأخر لأنه هيدا عصبية جمهوره تجاه حزب الله مرتبطة بتجربته التحريرية اللي هي عسكرية فهيدا اللجيتيمسي تبعه عالي ومكون أساسا لليش هني مع حزب الله فمنا نقطة خلافية عنده لبل بتشد له عصبية ما بين نشد عصب بوجهه وهيدا بتخلص باقتتال أنا برأيي المحل اللي لازم يكون منطق الخلاف مع حزب الله موجه صوبه هو غاية كل العمل السياسي ومن ضمنه سلاح شو الغاية النهائية؟ أي بلد بدك؟ إذا هيدا السلاح غايته يحمي واقع اللي عم نشوفه هلا بالبلد هيدا هو النظام السياسي اللي أنا ضده وما في يكون في مقاومة فعلية من دون مشروع تحرري لأنه المقاومة هي شيء دفاعي عم دافع عن شو أنا؟ إذا ما عم دافع عن شكل مال الدولة وشكل مال العلاقات الاجتماعية مع الدولة ها منا مقاومة هذا طرف حامل سلاح لمشروع سياسي خاص فيه وهون بصير الصراع معك تتقدر أنت واحد واحد يلبن لبن بخياراته طيب أعطيني موقفك من شكل الحكومة الأفضل من مشروع الحكومة الأفضل من شكل النظام المصرفي من سعر سعر الصرف من الإدارة الشرائية تبع الناس إذا هو كلهم ما عندك أجوبة عليهم أنت فعليا خصم حكمة لو ما معك سلاح كيف إذا معك سلاح فسلاحك أنت بده يصير هو حماية لمنطق بعادة منطق قيام دولة أنا ما بناقشه بالشيء اللي هو بيصير من المقدسات لسببين أول شيء لأن المقدسات الحكي فيها لا طائلة منه بصير مثل حوار الأديان هي بيعملوها كل فترة شو يعني؟ شو يعني حوار الأديان؟ هو مطلقات هو مطلقات مقدسة إذا تحاوروا الأديان يعني معقول يصير في توافق على عقيده مشتركه لا يمكن فكره كيف بدهم يتعايشوا بعدين يصير بالانس اوف باور فهيدا لا طائل منه لانه مقدس ولا هم من انه مقدس هو لانه موازين القوى بتقول لك اذا حكيت فيه ولا ما حكيت فيه شو عم تعمل يعني اذا قلت له ايه سلم سلاحك قال لي لا السؤال شو كيف بتبني ميزان قوى بوجه اي طرف سياسي تيصير لك معنى تحاوروا اما تاثر بعناوينه السياسيه والمنطق اللي مفروض يشكل له أزمة لحزب الله أم بتمنى ما يشكل له أزمة ويجاوب عليه بيكون حل المشكلة عنده وعندي أنه يعطي مضمون سياسي ليه كل العملية السياسية من ضمنها في سلاحه ومن ضمنها في قصص تانية 
شو هو المعنى السياسي؟ نجيب مئاتي ويوسف خليل وهي الحكومة وهي الشكل اللي بنعرفه اللي هو عم يدافع عنه لليوم حسب الله أما شيء تاني هيدا أنا برأيي محل الصراع I'll, I'll answer it very quickly and I, I, won't, I won't debate this I'll just add to it I think if you, if you have a way to and the security component that is Hezbollah, not the political party, if you can get that out of the way, and if you can imagine, it's hard to imagine, a political party called Hezbollah that looks like the rest of the Lebanese parties. And I think that's the story of reform to me, that it's a post-civil war political party that has to do better, not worse. I think then you can start engaging this group. And I think that's what we should have dialogue with Hezbollah that is dialogue about politics, not engaging over security, because there's no dialogue there. Well, and I'll just add one more thing. Political violence should be, should be over. We shouldn't have to worry about this right now. The threat of Hezbollah's violence should not even be in the discourse. We should be able to talk to that party about politics and then celebrate them when they do politics right, not have this overarching problem that is, what does Iran want from Hezbollah? Sorry if I answered uh, without being asked, but I thought it was to both of us. Hello. Uh, hi, Jad. Hara Sroji, a Sahafi comment. So, Ellen, sorry, Ayn. Shimon, can you call Musta Abel Libnan? Is a Marifna mean Fajar and Tafajar Arba Ab? السؤال الثاني بتعتقد انه هي انفجار ولا تفجير؟ السؤال الثاني اي دونت لايك تو سبيكيوليت لانه فعليا ما عندي معلومات وراح يكون كثير هيك تقديري الجواب. السؤال الاول انه اذا ما قدرنا نعرف شو صار بانفجار اربعة بتصور ما راح نقدر نعرف مثل ما كل الاغتيالات ما قدرنا نعرف مثل ما كل الانفجارات ما قدرنا نعرف هو استمرار لنظام خلق بالحرب الأهلية مبني على ممنوع يكون في محاسبة هيدي هي مناقضة لها والدليل أنه أول ما خلصت الحرب الأهلية أول قرار هو عفو عام عن كل جرائمة لأنه فعليا بدك تثبت شرعية أنه في ناس ما في يجي قاضي عليها بحجة شي جريمة عاملها يكون أعلى من سلطة السياسة عليه وصلنا لمحل هلأ سيء للغاية أنه حتى لو إجا قاضي وجرب يعمل هيدا الدور ايه ما القاضي شو بي يعني القاضي بيطلع قرار مين بينفذه؟ انا برايي يعني بروبابيلتي وايز ان شاء الله كله ما يصير ومعقول هيك رح يصير بس بروبابيلتي وايز انه يموت القاضي على انه يموت السياسه بهالبات هيدي اعلى ب 100 مره القاضي اخرتها شو؟ ويا ما ميت ناس يعني المشكل هو انه نحن بمحل ما في دوله وقت ما يكون في دوله انا كثير بشبهه لنظام العلاقات الدوليه بين الدول لأنه ما في نظام فوق الدول تيجبر كل واحد بدور وقانون وكذا تخلص موازين قوى بيصير في حرب مثلا بأوكرانيا ما حيالله محل العالم في ناس مع في ناس ضد وكذا بس صوت بيصير المع والضد ما قالوا عازي لأنه في موازين قوى بروت مثل منا بتفرض حالة بالقوة أنا بتصور هيدا السيستم رح يتجزر أكتر وهيدا ما في يخلص إلا باقتتال دورة جديدة وانا بتصور هالدورة جديدة منا كتير قريبة بس في واحد يشوفها وما راح تكون شكلها كله هذا تخيل لان هذا كله واحد عم بيقدر بشيء اذا مشي بصورة مستقيمة وقليلة الحياة السياسية تمشي بصورة مستقيمة بس اذا بقى انهيار مؤسسات الدولة بالسرعة اللي عم بيصير فيه بقى التغيرات الديموغرافية عم بتصيب المجتمع من خلال الهجرة وقلة الولادات من بعض الازمة المالية وحالة الأجانب بلبنان يعني سوريين وفلسطينيين وغيرهم موجودين بلبنان رح تغير بالديموغرافيكس بالبلد وتخلي الأمن الذاتي قريبا يصير حاجة تكل واحد يضبط منطقته تتبلش تطلع هاي أكتر ويصير عندك نظام سياسي ما عنده القدرة يتعامل مع هالتغير الكبير اللي صار بالديموغرافيكس أكيد بين الطوائف أما بين اللبنانيين والأجانب يعني بين الطوائف أساسا والديموغرافيكس تغيروا كتير عن شو بيقول نص الدستور انه مناصفة وكذا ومدري شو، هيدي جا كل فترة واحد بلمح لها بس بعد في قرار سياسي انه ممنوع ينفجر بس إذا هي ما عم نقدر نديرها بالتي هي أحسن تنبقى في افيشنت ستيت وبنفس الوقت 
يعني افشنسي اني باخد القرارات وبنفس الوقت ما اخدها على عنف نحن كل فتره عندنا دوره عنف كيف اذا بكره السؤال بده يصير بين لبناني وغير لبناني في حدا يتخيل بهيك بلد كيف تخلص هيك قصص فانا هذا اللي بخوفني اكثر شيء انه بعتقد شكل الصراع المقبل ما راح يكون بس بين طوائف لبنانيه راح يكون بشكل مجتمع مختلف تماما عن اليوم وهذا يمكن 15 10 سنين من هلا who knows the international investigation that didn't happen i think would begin to point in the right direction there's only one example يا جاد one example انا هون دائما هون محل الخلاف بيني وبينك hey. انا اي انترناشونال تريبيونال اما انفستيجيشن ما بتحل المشكله اللبناني بغض النظر بتجيب حقيقه ولا ما بتجيب حقيقه بالمعنى الانفستيجيتيف اي شيء خارجي بيبقى نزاعي بالداخل انه هولي مؤامره وما مؤامره بتزيد حجره جديده على نفس الصراع القديم بدك من الداخل شرعيه جديده شرعيه وحده على القليل يمكن تكون سيئه للغايه اه تقول شرعيه وحده يعني في طرف يربح على طرف عكس كل تاريخنا غالب ومغلوب والغالب بيفرض شروطه على المغلوب ويا هالغالب بيقدر على الشروط يخليها سستينبل اللي راح تاخذ رضا مجتمعي يما المجتمع بينقلب عليه ما في دوله بالعالم بعرفها انا على كل حال هلا بالمودرن هيستوري تكونت ب كثير محبه يعني دائما في نموذج ساوث افريكا كثير مهم لكيف قدروا يتحاوروا الاقوى بفتره ما ما يقتلوا الاضعف ويتحالف هوية ليبني سوا باقل الاضرار هيدا هو مشروع اللي انا مش جاي نترشح له انتخابات يعني هيدا مشروع مواطنون عم يجي شو يقول هاي البلد رايح على حرب اهليه بتاعوا قبل ما نوصل لهيدا المحل نعمل تفاوض لكيف ندير هالبلد تجنبا للمخاطر وهذا الشيء بده ينزل من الحصص السياسيه و... ايه مشكلته طرح مواطنون ومواطنات انه موازين القوى مش لمصلحته ليش بدي فوضى لا بدي ابقى هيك يمكن لو صار في موازين قوى بتسمح ساعتها في حدا يفاوض على شيء ليتجنب مخاطر وهذا الشيء منه موجود اليوم. But facts given to a state that does its job would allow the state to arrest criminals. That's uh, facts given to a state that could arrest criminals would be the story. That's the whole story of investigation, indictment, prison sentence. I agree an international investigation. إذا بيجي حدا بيقول لك أنا ما بصدق الفاكس طبعا. ما فكرة القضاء يعني مثلا بأمريكا وتخبر انه فلان فلان قتل كندي yeah. في كثير ناس ما صدقوا ولا اليوم اتس بيج ايشو بس السلطة السياسية مجتمعة تخضع لهذا القرار وتصرف على اساسه I think the Hague should be at least a standard that we could aspire to it may not be perfect but if the Hague is doing if there's an investigation that says at least two people of a group are guilty for one attack The state then has to take that action, not not the Hague. That's where the Lebanese state kicks in. But fact finding by Lebanon, Tarabitar did exactly that, and then the whole story stopped. But I think I I share the sentiment that this is foundational stuff. It's not after. It's not a consequence to politics. That's the real story. If you can't have that happening here, there's there's no functioning state anymore. <laughs> بنية دولة أساسية صد قضاء وعسكر يعني. زيادة بشكل makes that point regularly actually. Yeah. Are there any more questions? And please yes, the last one because I will have a divorce. Make it fast. <laughs> in English or in Arabic? بالعربي لأنه حاب استعجل وبعتذر مسبقا على صياغة السؤال. لا مش مشكلة. أولا رشاد شحادي 21 سنة تلميذ بالأل أي يو. هل السؤال مصطحى بشكل خاص من تجربتي او كسبكتيتر بالاحرى على الانتخابات الجامعيه خصوصا ما الطابع تبعها عامه بالنسبه لي اولا حاسالك اكيد اذا بتتفق مع هالشيء في تحريف او حتى شذوذ بمفهوم المشاركه السياسيه بلبنان يعني بتاخذ مع بتتخذ معنا تبع اكثر من اي شيء ثاني انا شخصيا مؤمن انه اي انسان عنده مسؤوليه انه يحدد موقعه السياسي والاقتصادي بالعالم to situate oneself يعني economically politically لانه غير انه هالشي بمسه ان انا حاله بهالشي او لا ولكن كمان عنده مسؤولية تجاه الاخر اولا هل بتتفق مع هالشي وثانيا وين فكرك ممكن هالتغيير نبدأ ممكن نحققه 
وثالثا هالفكره كهالازمه او الوضع الراهن خلق الظروف الخصبه لحصول هالنوع من التغيير رايي خلق ظروف وكان في اوبورتيونيتي وبتصور هلا عم نفوتها للاوبورتيونيتي والاوبورتيونيتي ما بتبقى مفتوحه كل الوقت وقت النظام السياسي يكون بموقع ضعف الريتوريك تبعه والمفاهيم اللي بيعملها والناراتيفز تبعه بتضعضع بصير فيها كسور وهون بتقدر تزلطها هذا الظرف السياسي بيسمع لك بس اذا هلا بنجي بنحكي على الخطاب بسنه 92 بلبنان وقتها كان كل الناس متامله انه مزبوط اجى السلام ومزبوط رح يبلش اعاده الاعمار ورح يركب البلد وكذا ما حدا رح يسمعك انا يعني بيجي عم تجي تقول له انه هذا كله بده يفرض فيك اوكي ان شاء الله ما يفرض هلا خلينا نجرب عفوا بس مقاطع صغيره هل فراغات مثلا برايك عبيناها بال مثل ما بيقولوا الناشوناليستك ريتوريك او الريتوريك او المفاهيم الطائفيه اجمالا الشعارات الطائفيه هل فراغات هل انشيات هل هي فكرك اللي بت يعني بتعبيها هل لا انا برايي هول معبيين المنطق لان نحن ما هو شو اللي بيوحد الروايه الوطنيه؟ يعني وقت واحد يقول انه عندهم ريتوريك اما ناراتيفز هو اساسا ما كل الناس بتتمنى يعني كل يعني كل الكالتس بالعالم ترامب بيتمنى يخبر ناراتيف معينه عن امريكا بيقدر ولا ما بيقدر هو قدره الدوله على انه الناراتيف تبعها تبقى هي الطاغيه وهي ما بتبقى بقصه الاقناع وبس هي بتبقى بانه اتس آه شو بسموها كونفينينت اذا الحياه ماشي والشغل ماشي والامر في سلام واستقرار وبريدكتبيلتي وقادر واحد ينمى بقلب مجتمعه بصير عنده هو تندنس يسلم للنارات الموجود لان شغاله وقت ما تشتغل بقى بتسال سؤال هلا كيف واحد الوعي السياسي بكونه تيقدر هون بالبلد لانه مكون بصوره عوجه لانه بعده مصدره شغلتين انا برايي مصدره الاساسي هو ثقافه المواطنين بهالمناطق بالفتره العثمانيه اللي هي بتتكون بمناطق مجبورة تسكر على حالها وتحمي حالها لأنه مناطق بعيدة عن بعضها ونحن عطراف امباير منا بالسنتر تبع امباير نحن شيء هامشي صارت سلطة الشيخ بالضيعة ومدري شو أهم من الدولة الدولة شيء بعيد هاي لليوم بعد الناس هون بالبلد بتلاقي الدولة شيء بعيد إنه شو الدولة إنه فريد الخازن بيوجعني أكثر من الدولة إذا أراد يعني أما حيلا عيلة أما حيلا حزب هيدا المنطق اللي هو بعده عشائري بعده مترسخ لانه ما ازيل لا صار عنا ثوره صناعيه وصار في تحول الديموغرافيه لتنمى مدن كبرى ما صار هالشيء ولا صار عنا نظام راسمالي غير متصل بال يعني بسموه نحن نظام كولونيالي راسمالي كولونيالي يعني نحن عنا راسماليه بس مش قائمه بذاتها قائمه باتصالها مع الخارج من دونه ما في شيء هون فهو الحالتين نظام راس مالي و تطور ديموغرافي بتامنه اما ثوره صناعيه اما نظام راس مالي نفسه ما صاروا بقى بقينا كلانز عندنا تماس دائم مع ثقافات خارجيه هذا التماس مع الثقافات الخارجيه بفوت مصطلحات من الفرديه لحقوق الانسان بس هو مش طالعين من اكسبيرينس ذاتيه ومش غلط يعني مش ضروري تطلع من اكسبيرينس ذاتيه بس بعدنا نحن ما عم بيخلق ديناميك داخلي من منطلقات يونيفرسال بس هي ديناميك داخلي بعد ما خلق تيكون هو هالثقافه بهيدا الوقت بدنا نخلق على صعيد خاصه الطلاب اللي ثقافتهم كثير معقول تكون ويسترن بالقيم عم بحكي بالفاليوز منيحه بس خلينا نفهم بلدنا منيح لنعرف كيف نتعامل معه ما فينا نسقطهم تسقيط عليه هيدا المنطق اللي بده واحد يحاول يردمه بين شو الفاليوز لان الفاليوز فيها تكون انا برايي بخطوط العريضه مش بكل شيء بخطوط العريضه فيها تكون في شيء يونيفرسال بس بدنا نفهم بلدنا وبدنا نعرف كيف نتعامل معه بالاخر انا برايي ما في شيء رح يركب جديا الا ما مش قصه تو سيتويت وان سيلف اوكي اكيد اكيد كل انسان وقت بده ياخذ خيار سياسي بده يكون عنده خيار طوعي مش موروث يعني مش لاني خلقت مسيحي انا حكما يعني او ما اول ما تصير هيك اسال حالك شو القصه في مشكله هون بده يكون خيار طوعي يعني عقلاني يعني انتلكشوال يعني بده واحد يضطر تو سيتويت هيم سيلف فهون ساعتها واحد بيشوف اذا القوميه والشيوعيه هون بالبلد يقال عنهم دائما انهم مسقفين اكثر من غيرهم هني مش اساس بسقفين اكثر من غيرهم، هن الوحيدين اللي بيضطروا يدافعوا عن خياراتهم فكريا، 
الباقي اذا انت كنت عوني بيجوني ما حدا رح يضطر يسالك انت ليش عوني فكريا؟ انت بدك تدافع عن مشاكلك اليوم يعني بيكون عندك مشكله مع القوات وكذا فبتتعامل مع الكرنت ايفنتس احزاب اللي هي مش مرغوبه اجتماعيا هون بالبلد عم بحكي من العشائر القائمه بتضطر تنبش عن فكره سياسيه تبرر فيها وجودها هيدا لازم ينعمل اكيد بس القصه الاهم انه واحد يعرف انه سيتويتنج ون سيلف هو شغله انتقاليه هي شغله بتتغير منا ثابته لان اذا بتثبتها بتصير طائفه من طوائف بس طائفه علمانيه فبده كل شيء يكون قابل لانه يتطور وشكرا ولازم اركض لميل اي سا هاو ماني ميس كولز اي جست سي جاد از ا بودكاستر as somebody who's very persuasive in your own right, and somebody who's involved in politics without being a politician, uh, you are one of these modern day thinkers. And I want to thank you for giving me the longest episode I've ever done. <laughs> so, I want to, to apologize. No, thanks to you, Jack. Thanks for listening and watching. and a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan. <laughs>